Shalom. I am here with Father Stephen DeYoung. And of course, he needs no introduction because everybody who's ever listened to my channel already knows who he is. Um, and so I was on my way to a Halloween party and I get an email that says, uh, hi, this is Father Stephen. Would you like to talk? And my response was, uh, depends. Is it really you or my friends pulling my leg? And apparently it was actually you. <laughs> <laughs> it was indeed. Yes. <laughs> so why, why <laughs> someone of your, and I do want to ask what, why are you the very reverend? Why are you not <laughs> the reverend? So that, that means that I am an archpriest, which Ooh. is a title they give you instead of a raise. Um, and but I, I, I'm joking a little there. Really, what it, it's, it's an honorary title, and okay. I'm, I'm not into the title stuff. But uh, the, the reason I was made an archpriest is that my parish, the people I serve here in our community, petitioned to have me made an archpriest. So it's meaningful oh, okay. to me because of that. Well, <laughs> I am here with the very reverend <laughs> Father Stephen. Um, and so I, I tried reading at least some of your book. Um, I So just to give it a little bit of an introduction, when um, I was referred to the Lord of Spirits podcast, I went, oh God. And <laughs> I went to listen to it. And my response was, which may sound like faint praise, but for me, it's actually really high praise. Um, the amount Judaism was misrepresented was incredibly low. <laughs> well, I try. <laughs> that's that's so. And that's, that's why I love you, because you do try. Um, now, I, I have to say, um, well, let's, let's pull, pull up. Okay. Okay. Yes, the chart. I yes. said that you don't like the chart. I do not like this chart. And in <laughs> fact, I am pretty sure that I saw somebody quote this chart on Twitter. And my response was, you need to read more. Because it was, it was one of the ortho bros. You need, you need to spend more time paying attention to Father Stephen because you wouldn't be making this mistake. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I can explain this chart. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sure you will still not like the chart, but I can't explain the chart. Um, and I'm not just going to throw my publisher under the bus because they did kind of add the chart. But oh, um, okay. so uh, my understanding is that you mainly have problems with the last entry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Rather it, than it's the off entry. by a thousand years. I'm not sure right. which way. Right. So... <laughs> Um, so I heard you say, so, and I think this is the way I'm using the term rabbinic Judaism. Okay. And I'm not arguing that this is the correct way to use that term. Mm -hmm. Only that within biblical studies scholarship, which is admittedly predominated by Protestant Christians. And, that, and secular yeah. Jews. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, that 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 has become a a standard way to use the term in the sense that it's not rabbinic in terms of beliefs or practices mm. but in terms of periodization so there's pre-exilic right is right. Yeah. the religion of ancient israel then there's second temple judaism which is a flawed title but that's what's used right, right. and then after that it's just rabbinic judaism well, right. okay, so I'll I'll tell you. So I actually created a little reference sheet uh, on Safari, which is in the um, in the description if people want to take a look at it about some of the stuff I thought we might talk about. But of course, we can talk about whatever you would like to talk about. Um, but one of the things I noticed. So in your book, you bring up Yigdal as a hymn. And you say from the fourth or fifth century. And it was like, that helped me understand that chart a lot better because Yigdal was actually written in 1402 and right. did not become popular among Jews until 
oh, I would say probably two or 300 years ago. It is incredibly popular right now. But I got kind of the impression that you were um, kind of putting the Christian frame of, oh, well, this is Nicaea. And so the Nicene Creed is like, you know, so when that was formulated, this this made a sort of creed for Judaism, whereas Yigdal, I do argue with a lot of Jews uh, that I think it should be considered a creed for us. Um, and it's one of the ways Orthodox Jews will actually say that reform and conservative Judaism isn't Judaism. But the Yigdal, the way it it became what it became is simply through popularity. And because it's a popular thing Jews sing, it's become a creed. Right. And, and I saw that correction on the date. I'm going to try to, I'm going to verify that. I'm not going to try to. I'm going to verify that. And okay. assuming well, I, it sounds I, like I made a mistake there, the I'll correct that in future printings. Okay. Right. Well, if, yeah. if you're going to do that, I, I, I have lots of comments on this. <laughs> right. But we right. Can so it. like on that, right, that's a factual thing, right? I'm sure there's lots you disagree with because it's a Christian book, right? But, <laughs> but in terms of a factual thing, right, like, like I want to get that correct. And th what, what this points to, what this points to, and this may be the case in some other things that you bring up also, um, is why I bring this up. So I've been studying... Second Temple Judaism for 30 years. But my knowledge, I am not even like foot in the door in terms of the Talmud. I am not, like, I am not, that is not my field, right? I'm not a scholar of later Judaism, right? Um, so, um, <laughs> so, um, what, I, when I make statements about later Judaism, for the most part, I am getting them secondhand from Jewish scholars of Second Temple Judaism that I'm reading. Right. And so, like in this case, I may have gotten that secondhand and not gotten, right, right. And like I said, I'll correct yeah. it, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so that they, so, so, but that at least is going to color because even though some of them are like Daniel Boyarin is an Orthodox Jewish person. Right. That that doesn't mean he identifies that way, at least. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, no, I, I, I know yeah. the rabbi of the I mean, I knew when I went up to UC Berkeley, like I met the rabbi of the synagogue. He, you know, okay. I, I haven't been up there for a little while. So I know the synagogue he yeah. goes to and he's orthodox in a very similar way as I am, which okay. is I, I yeah. would not I would not make my rabbi feel in any way <laughs> uh, bad about my heresies. So, right. you know. <laughs> right. so, but so he's, he's, even though he's an Orthodox Jewish person, he's not a scholar of the Talmud either. Right. He's a scholar of well, yeah, earlier, so. right. Earlier, right. Rather than later Judaism. Right. Everybody so specializes he, in scholarship. He, so this is, part of the, this is part of the problem here. So like when in Judaism, when we talk about somebody who's a scholar of the Talmud, we're usually talking about so somebody like Rabbi Mo Moses Feinstein, who um, was universally accepted as a scholar within Orthodox Judaism and occupies a role that would be almost similar to something like a patriarch in Orthodox Judaism. Because when Rabbi... Um, when Rabbi Feinstein said something was kosher, basically all of Judaism was like, okay, it's kosher. And when he said something's not kosher, basically all of Orthodox Judaism said it was not kosher, right? Um, and so within Orthodoxy, there is this hierarchy of scholarship, which is an informal hierarchy. And I have to say, you know, when, when I speak to somebody else about Talmud, it's very, very easy to know who knows more Talmud and who knows less Talmud, partially because it's such a deep sea that um, honestly, it, it becomes it's it becomes really, really easy to see, 
okay, this guy knows a lot more than I do, right? Because the Talmud is is huge. And yeah, <laughs> one of the things I actually wanted to talk to you about was, so um, one of the things I keep on going on on my channel about is my surprise in um, when I started looking at the Gospels myself, as opposed to by discussing them with Christians, was seeing how Talmudic Jesus was. And so obviously the Talmuds, right, the, the, the Babylonian Talmud, you know, was finalized around the year 500. But, and this is one of the things I've seen from 4Q MMT, which I only recently discovered, is how the environment of Talmudic discussion did exist in Second Temple uh, Judaism in ways that I actually, I when I read in the Mishnah, I always thought it was anachronistic. The Mishnah was kind of, you know, superimposing what those rabbis thought into Second Temple Judaism. And ultimately for me, it, it was surprising how Talmudic Jesus seems to me. He he seems very, very Talmudic. And so when in Orthodox Judaism we talk about Talmud, we're talking about a hermeneutic more than a book. And so it's 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 a very different thing. And you know, I for one of the things, so when you were talking about you, you spoke about uh Rabbi Akiva, and you've told this story several times uh, from Chagiga, right? And I went and looked at it, and um, I mean, we could pull it up, but it seems to me that how you're seeing that discussion is is not how I would describe it at all. Okay. Well, let me let me make sure. <laughs> right. We're on the same page in terms of what I'm trying to say about it. And you may still disagree. Right. <laughs> but, but at least we'll be disagreeing about the right thing. Right. Um, so and that is something that I know for a fact I'm getting secondhand from Daniel Boyar. Right. I, I know for a fact. Right. He's the one who called my attention to that um, in a series of lectures he gave. Um, so. What I'm getting at with that, and, and a big chunk of Religion of the Apostles, or the first part of Religion of the Apostles, is talking about how within Second Temple literature, there is one of the ways of resolving, and I know you've, you've talked about this, that this tension is there in the text, like of the Torah, between God whom no one can see and live and God who is seen. One of the ways in Second Temple literature that gets resolved is by introducing an intermediate figure of some sort. Okay. So in Jubilees, you have the Angel of the Presence or different texts, different things. And so one of the basic things that Christianity does very early is take all the names for those different intermediate figures <laughs> ball them all together and say, this is Jesus of Nazareth. Right? And when I say oh. very early, uh, say Justin Martyr, say Justin the Philosopher, literally does that in his dialogue with Trifo. He lists off all those names, right? The angel of the Lord, the word, memory, right? All of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? Sam wants us to talk about God one and God two, like Paul Van Dyke. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I, and I, so I, then, so to get to the Talmud part, right? Right. So the way I have learned this from, from Daniel Boyarn is that obviously Judaism rejects that, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, I actually disagree that Judaism rejects. Well, re rejects the Jesus of Nazareth part. <laughs> right? I'm not even sure about that. We can talk about that. Okay. Like, yeah. yeah. No, I'd love to talk about it. Okay. Um, yeah. But rejects the Christian version of it, however we want it. Yeah. Um, St. Justin's version was <laughs> rejected by Trifo in the discussion, at least. Um, so, um, but in, so then the way I learned this is that there are a couple of places, that being one of them in the Talmud, where that tradition of the intermediary figure is addressed. 
and in different ways, right, sort of is clarified from the Jewish perspective, <laughs> right? In the sense that there's a there's a limit placed, right? Like like this teaching is okay as long as you don't transgress this, right? Okay, so and that makes so, you outside the. <laughs> So this is this is the part of the Talmud that you're talking about, um, yeah. and it is it is on um, the Father Stephen sheet I I created, mm -hmm. um, and so right and and like you're saying, so this is pages and pages of Talmud which is discussing yeah. this particular thing, and w well, part one thing I have to say is please if if you're coming from outside of Judaism and you're reading the Talmud in translation for the love of God, do not use the Sensino edition. Many Christians do. Um, the Steinsaltz edition is available completely free online. Um, and there is a translation of the Jerusalem Talmud, Talmud also available completely free online on Safari. Um, this is the Steinsaltz edition. If you want a deeper and even better understanding. Um, Art Scroll is not free, but um, I I would argue if if you're serious and you're reading in translation, you should probably be looking at the Art Scroll. But th this is this is the actual part that you're talking about in um, and it's it's pretty long. But uh, so the the bold uh, English part here is what's actually in the text and the non-bolded is trying to help explain the text because you have to understand um, the Talmud is itself mnemonic and there's a lot of disagreement about what the, the words mean and how. So it's looking at the Talmud as anything in any way similar to scripture, um, I, I would say is is just a misunderstanding of the Talmud itself. And so um, the the Talmud is in two parts: the Mishnah, which is um, the the mnemonic poem that Rabbi Judah the Prince redacted around the year two hundred, and then the two Talmuds have the Gemara, which is the the discussion of the Mishnah. And that's what most people mean by Talmud. So what, what it says here, the Gemara continues to reconcile verses that seem to contradict each other. One verse states his raiment was as white as snow, uh, white snow, and the hair of his head was uh, like pure white wool. Uh, and it is written, his locks are curled black as a raven. The Gemara answers, this is not difficult. Here, the verse in Daniel is referring to when he is in the heavenly uh, academy while there is uh, the verse in Song of Songs uh, speaks of when uh, he is at war for, for the master and the master is just an unknown rabbi, possibly an actual rabbi, Mar or not. That's a whole other thing. We'll get yeah. into it. There is no finer individual to uh, study Torah in an academy than an old man. And there's no finer individual to wage war than a youth. A different me metaphor is therefore used to describe God on each occasion. The Gemara poses another question. One verse, is, one verse states, his throne was fiery flames. And another phrase in the same verse states, till thrones were placed and one who was ancient of days sat, implying the existence of two thrones. The Gemara answers, this is not difficult. One throne is for him and one is for David, as it is taught in a Brita, which is a Mishnaic statement that was not included in the, in the Mishnah itself. With regard to this issue, one throne for him and one for David. This is the statement of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yosei Hagilili said to him, Akiva, how long shall you make the divine presence profane by presenting it as though one could sit next to him that there are two thrones? So there's this disagreement between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yo Yosei Hagilili. Rather, the two thrones are designated for different purposes, one for judgment and one for uh, righteousness. The Gemara asks, 
did Rabbi Akiva accept this rebuff from him or did he not accept it from him? The Gemara offers a proof. Come and hear. So it brings a different uh, Brita statement, uh, Mishnaic statement. One throne is for judgment and one for righteousness. This is the sta statement of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, uh, Elazar ben Azariah said to him, Akiva, what are you doing uh, occupying yourself with the study of Agada? This is not your field of expertise. Take your words to the topic of plagues and tents, which are what he was known for, meaning it is preferable that you teach the halachot of the impurity of leprosy and the impurity of the dead, which are within your field of expertise. Rather, uh, with regards to the th uh, two thrones, one throne is for a seat uh, and one is for a small seat. The seat is uh, to sit on and the small seat is for his footstool. As it is stated, the heaven are my seat and the earth my footstool. Now, I have to say, when we study Talmud, um, what we would say is, Elu velu elokim chayim. these and these are the words of the living God, especially when we are talking about something which is agotic like this. And so we study, oh, well, what is this idea being brought? What is this idea being brought? Did Rabbi Akiva actually agree? Was Rabbi Yosei Glili right? It was, you know, and it becomes a whole discussion. And to kind of frame that in a, in a sense of, well, the Talmud is teaching, you know, I, I often say when you when someone says the Talmud says, even though I end up saying the Talmud says, when someone says the Talmud says, they usually that usually means they, they have never actually looked at the Talmud because the Talmud is a record of a debate. Right. People arguing. Yeah. yeah. People <laughs> arguing. Yeah. And oftentimes there there is no resolution whatsoever especially on egotic statements like this, as, as you saw. So like the debate is, well, did Rabbi Akiva end up agreeing or not end up agreeing with that? Right. So, and I, I have to say like, from what I saw in your book, a lot of what um, you were saying, just as when we talk about Christianity, we, we often frame Christianity from a very Protestant lens Judaism gets framed oftentimes with in a very particular, especially reform and rationalistic sense, partially because honestly, I mean, when it comes down to it, as an Orthodox Jew, I'm I'm sitting here talking to a Galach. I, I'm not sure you ever heard that term. It's it's not exactly a nice term. Um, <laughs> it it literally means tonsured, um, and it's. And when little kids play it, it uh, play, ca uh, you know, uh, ca uh, catch me if you can or something like that, the, the person you're running away from is the gala. <laughs> so not exactly the nicest thing, but like from an Orthodox Jewish perspective, right? The idea that I'm sitting here describing a, the Talmud to a gala is not, is not, and let, let's put it this way. I'm not sure my rabbi would tell me to do this if I a had asked him. <laughs> I'm not sure he would say no, because there are there are some Orthodox rabbis, and I, I tend to be on in the more open, right, not the insular, but um, a very large amount of Orthodox Judaism would be saying to me, what are you doing talking to a Galah? <laughs> <laughs> right, well, yeah, that that... You know, we only had a brief chance to talk before we went live. And yeah. that is that is part of the difficulty here, right? So like when I when I was 19, I went and read Thomas Aquinas for the first time and I read it with a bunch of Cistercian monks. So I could get it from the horse's mouth, right? The people who who believe this now, you know, <laughs> right? right. Um, and that's how I pre right, pre prefer to learn about things. Part, part of the, the issue here, I think, might be between us, right? Mm -hmm. um, might be in terms of my, my approach in general. At least I'm detecting here. So my approach, when I do biblical theology, mm -hmm. 
I don't do biblical theology as a subset of systematic theology. Meaning I'm not trying to sort of abstract teachings from the Bible and say, this is what the Bible teaches, <laughs> right? About this topic. Mm -hmm. I do biblical studies as a form of historical theology. So I'm trying to get at, here's when this was written. Here's the contours of belief at that time. And then here's how historically this has been interpreted. And so in this case, in terms of approaching like this section of the Talmud, right? I am less approaching it from the perspective of what does Orthodox Judaism authoritatively teach now about the two powers in heaven? And more from the perspective of after Christianity and Judaism split in the middle of the second century, Christianity goes through a development, Judaism goes through a development, those aren't totally independent. There's back and forth, right? They're defining themselves in terms of each other. And so how do these things that become core parts of Christian doctrine, like our Christology, or the doctrine of the Trinity, they're drawing those from this well of second temple thought. What happens with that thought sort of historically on the side of Judaism? That's what I'm trying to get at. And so that's why I think my approach and the way I've presented that, I'm, I'm historicizing it, well, right? Yes. And maybe that's inappropriate, right? Well, I, no, I, I don't know that it's inappropriate. I, I do have to say, I, again, it seems to me it's, it's kind of the approach that I was a little bit surprised. Oh, and I do want to ask you, so I went to an Orthodox wedding, okay. uh, Eastern Orthodox wedding. I've been to many Orthodox Jewish weddings, very different. <laughs> and at the end, uh, there was a line that kind of hit me. Um, Constantine and uh, was it Helena? Helen, uh, yeah, equal, his mother. Yeah. yeah, equal to the apostles. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there is a, there is a, a title that's given to certain saints. Okay. In the in the Orthodox Church, which is Is Apostolos, right? Right. Okay. You know, equal to the apostles, and the idea there is that the apostles went and spread the gospel and converted a lot of people to Christianity. Okay. So later saints who are responsible for mass conversions I tend to be given okay. that title. Okay. Well, so I mean, when when you look at something like Nicaea, and I think. Possibly you see this with the idea the council at Yav uh, Yavne or yeah, Jamnia. I don't avoid that language. I don't know if you've noticed, but I try to avoid calling it the council of Jamnia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so there, within Christianity, there are these councils and there are bishops and they get together and they, they make decisions, right? And part of the problem here, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that we really, especially Pharisaic and then rabbinic Judaism, um, never had, you know, it, it became, and, and the Talmud actually talks a lot about this, like sometimes the rabbis would make a takana, would make some sort of um, uh, edict or something, and everybody would ignore them. And, and the, I, I believe this is in the Talmud itself. It says, um, it says that, you know, if if people don't accept it, people don't accept it. And so there's a thing where, you know, for example, the Nicene Creed becomes established in Christianity. And after Nicaea, Christianity becomes defined by this creed. Whereas in Judaism, you might get for example, this discussion that's being discussed regarding these verses in the Talmud. And as that percolates out and up, there may be, you know, various things that people agree on. And so, for example, when we talk about, um, and I included 
and I highly recommend, especially everybody in this audience, uh, the, the one thing I would recommend going and reading for yourself is the Maimonides, when he was 23 years old, wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. And one of the most important chapters of the Mishnah is called Perik Chelek. It is where what is a heretic is defined. And um, I mean, you can read that for yourself. It's not going to help you that much other than seeing that the rabbis really did not like Epicurus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so when he wrote this commentary on the Mishnah, he, uh, he wrote a very long preface for it. And in that preface, he gives what he thought should be the 13 Ikarim principles of Jewish faith. And um, it's, I mean, it's pretty long. And I would, I, I would love to see your reaction to his prologue because he spends about 90% of it telling people stop taking things so literally. <laughs> um, and then he gives his, his, 13 Ikarim, which were debated, and to this day, people do debate, but they became a popular presentation of the J Jewish faith. In uh, It later became codified in two uh, different things that ended up being printed in our prayer books, which is the actual listing that people know of that I believe in perfect faith, that there is one God, right? And Yigdal, which is the hymn you were mentioning. And those became so popular that somehow, some, like retroactively, this thing that Maimonides wrote when he was 23 has kind of become definitional of how we understand that chapter of the Talmud and Mishnah which defines what a heretic is in Judaism. And to this day, I mean, by those 13, like, so the, the um, Israeli rabbinate uses those 13 principles to define what is Judaism and what is not. And that's how they keep conservative and reform Judaism outside of orthodoxy in Israel, right? So that is a very different process from the Nicene Creed. Right, right. I'm, I mean, in terms of my own studies, right, my area, I'm mainly interested in the period from the second century, really until the beginning of the fifth century, where the specific borders between Christianity and Judaism are being formed. Did you read, there's there's a book, um, the guy's name is Wilson, um, Related Strangers, I think it, it was called. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was the first real, you know, and um, part of what I've been finding is, so, for example, I have this idea, and I, I would love to hear what you think of it, but... So a lot of Christians have heard of Birkat Haminim, right? The, the blessing of the heretics. And many people have this idea that, okay, the, the blessing of the heretics is the reason why John and a lot of Christians stopped going to synagogue. And, but very few Christians have heard of the Amidah, the Shmon Esre, the 18 blessings, that the blessing of the heretics is the 19th. And to this day, I mean, if you go to into a Jewish synagogue and you talk about the Amidah, you will talk about the Shemon Israel, the 18 blessings. Uh, guess what? There's 19 of them today. And one of them is <laughs> the blessing of the heretic, right? Now, when you talk about, so on go gospel simplicity, I, I, I don't know if you watched my commentary on that. Uh, when you were on Gospel Simplicity and he asked you, um, you know, would a second temple Jew 
feel more comfortable in a church or in an Orthodox synagogue. Uh, I thought everything you said was correct, but it left an impression, which I think is, is wrong, which is, guess what? <laughs> a synagogue today is not like a synagogue 2000 years ago. Not surprising. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, when I read about Jesus going to the synagogue on Saturday and reading from uh, Isaiah, for me, that's like, well, he got an Aliyah, he got the Haftarah, and he was reading the Haftarah, right? And like, vast majority of Christians, like, if I come to your synagogue, you're not going to call me up for an Aliyah, and I'm not going to get the Haftarah, because that's not there. Just like the Amida is not there, the recitation of the Shema with its blessings is not there. Um, and it's, it's. I mean, I, if I go to a reform synagogue, they'll, they'll move things around, but I will still, and, you know, a Yemenite synagogue is going to have probably different, I mean, I know different words and it, it's going to be strange, but the sections of the prayers of the synagogue service i'm going to recognize whereas um you, and you know the idea that kaddish yeah kaddish you know was was not probably not in the in the synagogues that jesus went to and a lot of jews think you know that's that's the important part well no, but the Amida, the 18 blessings, were definitely there before the Birkat Haminim caused that split. And maybe for the audience, I mean, we should we should talk about what the Amida is, the 18 blessings, because I'm guessing vast majority of Christians, even if they've heard of the blessing of the heretics and how that resulted in Christians leaving the synagogue. The fact is, our synagogue service is a continuation of the synagogue service, which was established by the prophets after the destruction of the first temple, and the synagogues that Jesus and Paul went to. Whereas your service, and I, I mean, I don't mean this offensively, but I think if Jesus were to walk into your service, he would run out screaming, this is a bait of the Zara. This is a temple to a foreign God. Right. So, well, first I would say uh, we, of course, believe that Jesus is there for all of our services. And, uh, <laughs> but I'll um, agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So, so two parts to my response. And I, and I have seen those comments. Right. So, um, the first part is part of it is the audience I was talking to. So Austin is a Protestant. Most, not all, but a, the majority of his audience is Protestant. And so to a Protestant audience, their immediate thought from that question is, how is this even a question? Right? <laughs> like, how, how would this even be up for <laughs> right? discussion? Yeah. Right? Um, and so the way I approached answering it was to say, well, here, here's why there could be a discussion around this, right? Um, second part of my response. Um, I think what you're saying is absolutely true if the Second Temple Jewish person who we bring in the TARDIS with us to today is a Pharisee from Judea. You're absolutely right in that case. I think if he's from somewhere else, I think it might not be as clear. Let me give some examples okay. of what I mean. So we now, unfortunately, because of the brutal Roman de-Judification project, we have a number of first century Galilean synagogues that have been, have been excavated. And for example, in the entryways, they have these beautiful mosaics of the Zodiac with Hebrew inscriptions, <laughs> right? Um, so if we're talking to a Galilean, right? And these would have been the synagogues that Jesus was walking into, right? And, and oh, uh, well, Galilee, I, right? I mean, I have to say, 
I 100% agree with what you say, which is um, Ju Judaism as it exists now partially has rejected a lot of things because we took a look at how Christian Christianity right. was developing and went, oh my God. <laughs> and I think, for example, you know, uh, the Mishnah and the Talmud talk about reading the Torah in Greek, right? right. And so reading the Torah, having a Torah reading in Greek was something that was done. And it's definitely in reaction to Christianity that we're like, no, we are not translating this. No way. Hebrew, no. Stop translations. No translations. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, um, but, but my point I'm getting at there is that so... Seeing images, for example, seeing icons that are, would not necessarily send that person running screaming immediately. Correct. Right. <laughs> seeing a temple that is not in Jerusalem. See, this is the thing, the, the difference, I think, between a synagogue service and a temple service. And very much your service includes temple worship type yes. things in it. Absolutely. Right? And... Um, obviously, when when Paul and Jesus were going to synagogue, that was like, I mean, we there are we have records of other temples to uh, uh, the Tetragrammaton in 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 other places. Obviously, not Pharisaic, and I would actually probably right. say Jesus and Paul would would have been as you know like. No, um, of those as they would to any, walking into any temple that's not the temple, right? So you have elements of the temple services and I would say worship. I mean, I was really happy to hear that the, that you guys don't do icons of the Father, the monarchical trinity within from an Orthodox Jewish standpoint. So part of the argument we've had over is Christianity uh, idolatry, right? Obviously, what we call in Hebrew shituf and what is called in, in Islam shirk. And by the way, if Lewis is watching from, uh, from uh, Orthodox Shahada, you're welcome on my channel. Um, <laughs> the, um, I think it's like midnight where he is, so I don't know if he is. But... <laughs> if he watches later, you're yeah. still welcome on my channel. But... Um, the, you know, so in, in Judaism, we say that shituf is allowable for Gentiles. It's absolutely forbidden for Jews, but it is allowable. And there's been a debate for a very long time whether the Trinity um, constitutes shituf or not. And part of the confusion a lot of time we've had is we've always been like, well, the egalitarian Trinity, which for a lot of us, well, that's what Christians say, right? That's definitely like egalitarian Trinity. That's polytheism. I'm sorry. Um, the, the monarchical Trinity, I would say, um, and this is part of the discussion I have with Sam. I actually, I, I say to him, you know, your version of Unitarianism is actually... I would say less Jewish than the monarchical Trinity. Of course, he disagrees with me. Um, but this idea, and you talk about it in your book, and it's it's absolutely correct. And it was kind of funny for me to see you say, well, rabbinic Judaism completely disagrees with this. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, Paul yeah. Says, I'm happy yeah. to hear, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> And I would say definitely not. I, I would say, I mean, there there are groups within Judaism, especially in um, in kind of reaction to Christianity, have very much like this idea that there is a divine council, right? That there is, uh, so like when we talk about hypostases of God, right? And pers a person of God, uh, I, I, I've started saying a representation of God, right? So Judaism definitely has this, okay, we have the ineffable God, and we can talk about God one, God two, you can talk however you want it. But so we have the ineffable God, and we have the God who, in fact, does 
show himself into the world. And this is an important tension within the text that I think you definitely see, especially with the different names, right? So when the Shema says, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, right? It's saying there, these two things are in fact one, and there is a tension there, an important tension there, right? And for me, the, the problem becomes, in fact, when Christianity really seems to be um, saying, okay, what we can see, what is revealed, that's, that's God. And it's like, no, 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 that's God condescending to reveal himself into this world. And so that's why Shem Havaya, right, the, the, the Tetragrammaton is ineffable and is, you know, something that certainly we would not, even though we would say it, it, God's name is called on angels or people, right? And that's, I mean, this is the background to my, to my um, whole thing. Right, the twin commandments, Vaapta et Havaya, right? You shall love the Tetragrammaton, and Vaapta Lorecha, you shall love your fellow man. This twin commandments, which it I have to say, it Mark 12 is the most Jewish thing Jesus ever said. Right? Um and so what becomes a problem for me is, and I, I give this. Uh, example all almost always when you say the bar, uh, burning bush was representing representing a hypostasis of god a a representation a person of god i have no problem with that i have a problem with the idea that if the burning bu i was in front of the burning bush and i threw some water on it and let's say it did go out that suddenly you would accuse me of de deicide Right. Because yeah. Yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I want to only momentarily, because this is actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you, well, I wanted to talk to you about. Um, only briefly put a pin in this, just to finish up something with the previous question. Okay. And that's in terms of the temple worship, right? So if we're talking, again, if we're talking about random second temple <laughs> Jewish person, right? So you've got, for example, the Qumran community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because they had completely repudiated the Second Temple, they had incorporated some of the temple worship elements in their own. Do you believe the worship. Qumran community is, is the early Christian community? No. You don't? No, okay. no. Because I, I've been reading uh, Eisenman's book, James, the Brother of Jesus. Yeah, he does. Okay. <laughs> and I... Yeah. He's very convincing. Yeah, yeah. I think there's I think there's too much we don't know. There's certainly connections. Right. So uh, I will offer this. I don't offer it to most people. Uh, but if you would like a copy of my dissertation, I will get you one. Oh. Um because a big part of it is me talking about how the Johannian literature in the New Testament has to be read as Second Temple Jewish texts. And a lot of it is the relationship between them and things at Qumran. So you might find at least that part interesting if you'd like to have a copy of that. That um, sounds very interesting. But yes. but I, so I, I don't know if I'll get to it. I have so much of yeah, your stuff yeah. all ready to There's get no to. No it. deadline either. You could you know keep it for as long as you want it. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, but the the Qumran community had made that incorporation, which Christians eventually did also, right? You also find, you know, the temple at Leontopolis, right? So at least a, a bunch of Alexandrian Jewish people had, you know, done, done something with that, right? So that's why I say if the second temple Jewish person we grabbed happened to be one of those people, they might not be as put off by an Orthodox service, right? right? I, I just think Jesus But a Pharisee from Judea, a Pharisee, Pharisee yeah. from Judea, yes, you're right on on that, <laughs> right? 
and, and, and back I, to the Trinity, which, yeah, yeah. like Go I said, I, 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 this is what one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. So, because I've heard you make comments like this before, I've heard you use the term hypostasis in ways that I think made Sam a little uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do you, would you say uh, that if someone within today's Judaism held to what someone could broadly call a Trinitarian view, but something like what Philo held, that God has his word and his wisdom, mm. and that his word and his wisdom represent him in the world, right? In the world of, of human experience, right? And then he himself remains beyond, right, the world of, of human. You're experience. describing what Orthodox Judaism right. believes right so now. So that would be, even though you have there two other hypostases of the one God, that would be completely what One of the acceptable. things, so, one of, so there, there are very small communities within Orthodox Judaism which reject um, the Lurianic Kabbalah. Um, and those very small and I would say heretical communities that generally will not rear their heads because they would be, uh, you, they are often, there are some people who will willingly reject the Lurianic Kabbalah. And part of why they will reject it is they will say, what are you talking about? This isn't monotheism. And I, I, we get a lot of Christians saying the Kabbalah or Kabbalism, and I have to say, anyone who uses the word Kabbalism, you can pretty much guarantee is an anti-Semite. Um, ten, we'll say Kabbalism believes in ten gods. We obviously don't believe in ten gods. We believe in one god, and this tension between God the ineffable, right? Uh, and God, as he is presented into the world, is it's it's an inescapable tension in the Hebrew text. And it's been throughout Judaism. I there are people who will say that um, Maimonides what because of some of his statements, was not initiated into the Kabbalah. And in that sense, to the uh, if you read him as rejecting the Kabbalah, look, anybody who claims to be an Orthodox rabbi, certainly a prominent Orthodox rabbi today, uh, somebody was anathemized a few years ago because he... Uh, not because he disagreed with the Kabbalah, but because he was explaining things in ways that were not in keeping with the Lurianic Kabbalah. So that is how pervasive the Lurianic Kabbalah is within Judaism today. So uh, what you are describing is not is not just not foreign to Judaism. It is definitional within Judaism that God, God's chachma, right, God's wisdom, is in fact a garment, a lavush, through which he reveals himself in this world despite being ineffable. And in fact, his name itself, right, even the, the Tetragrammaton itself is a hypostasis. Like, so I, have, you, have you actually been introduced to the Kabbalistic reading of Genesis 1? 1? Bereshit bara Elohim. Yeah, I know right. Genesis one. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know that I know the the. the so, the so this reading, which a lot of people find quite shocking, right? In the beginning, created God. Me right. and this is what the Kabbalists will say is that at the beginning of creation, God first created the concept of God because. That itself is, is in fact a hypostasis. Like the fact you can refer to God is a hypostasis of the ineffable God. 
right, right. And so this this was my suspicion <laughs> upon hearing you talk, right? That that has had more of an afterlife in Judaism than that is going to. And I was happy to hear just a few minutes ago when you were talking about the Shema, right? You, you do not know the amount of pushback I get. From and this is I don't think Sam has ever said anything to me about this, but from some biblical Unitarian or Unitarians and uh, and Muslims pointing out that it's okay. God, not Yahid in the Shema. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> I, have to, I have to disagree with this differ differentiation between Ahad yeah. and Yahid. Okay. Uh, I I think in Judaism you see the problem of the one and the many. In, in our scriptural texts. And what I keep on going back to is this verse from um, Song of Songs, I believe it is. Uh, Love the waters of the many. Mayim rabim lo yichlu lachabot et hava. They cannot quench love. And this difference between the rabim and the echad or yachid is actually something like if you use your concordance and you go through you will find especially this this concept of the many waters mayim rabim mm -hmm. right as opposed to god as echad is is part of this tension of one and many which in greek philosophy and so this is my little thing that nobody agrees with but i will say the Greek alphabet derives from the Hebrew alphabet or Phoenician alphabet. Yeah. Meaning that when you ask the question of what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem, the answer is quite a bit, much more than it has to do with Beijing and even Memphis, right? Because oh, yeah. from the very beginning, we were sharing an alphabet alphabet meaning that there was a scholar scholarly exchange of texts right and so um this problem of the one and the many shows up within the jewish texts themselves it is in our torah and in the bible and throughout our theology the problem i have is this privileging of three over two or four or five or six or seven or 26 or a hundred and, and, and the Kabbalists go all the way three, six, yeah. they, they you go to a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so what I, what I often say to, to Christians, and this is another one of my, sorry, not sorry is um, I think Jesus was talking about the Trinity in, in the gospels uh, when he said um, three times, you will deny me. Um, that's the Trinity. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to go with Benjamin Summer has a line where he says that by by the standards of some forms of Judaism, the Trinity is really conservative and overly reserved. Right? <laughs> like it's it's too you know um, rated. So so I, yeah, like I said, I suspected that this might be the case, and so so I had thought we got to this anyway. I had thought I might approach it from the perspective of the Spirit of God, but I mean, we're kind of already there. So this is why I said earlier that I think the Christology part is more dividing us than the Trinity per se, right? So that, have you seen this yeah. image I use a lot on my channel? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of my favorite images to use. And partially because it is so shocking to Christians for a Jew to use it, <laughs> but partially because um, I, I actually think, um, I, I, I think it is an image through which we can help understand each other, Jews and Christians in ways we, we have not before. Um, and I think the Christology that the early um, that the early Christians had, and to some extent, we're seeing a revival of in in the Messianic Jewish movement. So I wouldn't be able to say this if Rabbi Michael Skoback, 
who is a respected rabbi within Orthodox Judaism. He is um, he works for Jews for Judaism in in Canada, which is an anti missionary Jewish organization. So not a friend of Christianity in yeah. in most ways, but he is a friend of Christianity in that he does talk to a wide spectrum of Christians. And he has said that Judaism is going to have to deal with Orthodox Jews who are halachically, who are within Orthodox Judaism and also believe Jesus will be the Messiah. And I am not aware of anything... There's a reason, and this is a discussion I'm hopefully going to be having with some Messianic Jews. There's a reason why within Orthodox Judaism, the standard for finding out if you're a wolf in sheep's clothing has been, will you, um, will you denounce Jesus or not? It's not because Orthodox Judaism believes you need to denounce Jesus. It's because it's the one thing that those people who are being all things to all men and trying to Ill infiltrate our communities will not do, which is they will lie about everything and they will lie about everything. They will not deny Jesus. And so it's become the litmus test. For how do I know that you're not a Christian trying to convert my children? But, and I, I know the ortho bros will lose their minds because all the Islam bros lose their mind when I say this. Judaism doesn't actually teach anything bad about Jesus. It actually really does not. And I, I have gone through all the stuff, I, the worst stuff in the in the Talmud. If if people want, we you know, I have it in my backlog. I'm not going to bother you with it. But um, yeah, the Jesus is not the sticking point that it is because of anything internal to Judaism. It's it's because of Christian doctrine, which. I'm guessing you don't agree with, uh, I'm hoping you don't agree with, <laughs> that um, a Christian can lie about anything except Jesus in order to convert a Jew. Well, yeah, of course not, right. <laughs> no, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'll just come out and say it. I don't, I don't care. Uh, one of the things I like least in the world is Christians pretending to be Jewish people. Um. Someone comes up to me and refers to Yeshua Mashiach, and I'm just like, "Come on, Bob, your grandparents are Norwegian. Like, what are you doing? You know, like, <laughs> you know." So, no, yeah, no, like that's one interesting thing about that image. I will add, you know, because you've pointed to the bad Hebrew. Um, <laughs> I have an example of worse Hebrew. Unfortunately, it's in my office, so I can't. Do that. There's, um, it's an icon from Greece of. The prophet Moses, who we call Prophet Moses the God Seer. And he's holding the the tablets of the, the Torah, right? And and whoever painted this icon didn't even know what Hebrew looked like. Okay. Right? It's just squiggles and like weird, you know, like bizarro. You know. So that, <laughs> that happens too. Um yeah. <laughs> but that's interesting yeah. because in in the Quran, uh, Moses is referred to as the God seer. There are a lot of things in the Quran that come out of non canonical Christian texts, apparently, from the Middle East. Well, I should say, come from traditions that are also reflected in those texts, right? We can't prove it's based on the text, right? But reflect the same traditions, right? The same. The same kind of uh, kind of ideas. Yeah, when I when I say that, although there's even I've heard Jewish people kind of get around this. When I say that Jesus is a sticking point, it's more, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know that a lot of contemporary Jews would sign on to uh, 
Jesus is the incarnate Memra <laughs> of God. <laughs> right. um, um, yes, I, I I don't think very many Jews would. Yeah. <laughs> so. the, the the and and I have to say, part of that, um, I mean, it's a lot easier for me to be gracious to Christianity. My family was in the Middle East during the Holocaust. And um, there definitely is, I mean, I, I can trace some of my family back to Spain during the Inquisition. Um, and there, there's definitely a lot of bitterness between the two communities. What I am hoping is that we can have a conversation and my argument within the Jewish community was we have no choice but to have a conversation where, um, and Rabbi Skoback has been saying this, where we are honest both with our own congregants and with the Christian community. Because obviously, you know, when, for example, I, I don't know if you have read The Great Disputation of Barcelona um, by Nachmanides. A long but, time ago. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I, I think it's, it's a very important fundament, fundamental text for this discussion between Jews and Christians. Um, but obviously, when he was speaking, despite all he talks about how freely he was speaking and how the king allowed him to speak freely, he was not speaking freely. And it's very obvious. And he got exiled for, <laughs> despite being told he could speak freely. And when, when it comes down to it, and, and Rabbi Skobak, I again, I could not say this if, if Rabbi Skobak has, had not said this. Um, we are going to have to level with our own community on what exactly is Jewish teaching about Jesus. Um, there, there's a debate that a rabbi had with Michael Brown. I, I think you know who Dr. I know Michael who he Brown. is, yeah. Yeah, there's a debate. And during the question and answer period, somebody asked the rabbi. Um, I forget what the exact question was, but it was something about Jesus. And the rabbi said, I, I'm not going to answer that. And I'm doing it in order to protect you. And like people in the comments are like, what's he not saying? And what he was not saying is um, Orthodox Judaism uses denouncing Jesus as a litmus test to know whether or not you are one of the many, many missionaries that get caught on a regular basis. And there's, there's articles about them on a regular basis, people who dress up as Hasidic Jews. One guy um, very recently... Um, became a, a rabbi and a mohel and a scribe in in Israel in a, in a Hasidic community and uh, was found out to be a, a Christian and he was not Jewish at all um, and the circumcisions he did had had to be redone and the Torah scrolls he wrote are obviously not kosher Torah scrolls and um the the Hasidic community, his wife had cancer. Um, he was found out after his wife died. Um, the Hasidic community had spent a very long time taking care of his wife, um, only to find out that he and his wife had spent years deceiving them um, in order to try to uh, convert us, right? And when you have people acting in that way, having a something that these people who will lie about basically anything because they are being all things to all men. Um, when the only thing you can say to somebody, somebody like that is, Hey, this is what Jesus says is the unforgivable sin. Are you going to deny Jesus? And they won't deny Jesus. Like it's, it's become the litmus test. And we cannot, we can no longer in a time of the internet retain this 
litmus test. Uh, because partially last night I was I, I I got to go see Jordan Peterson and I met a messianic Jew and he's he's halachically Jewish his parents are Jewish and um, I I count Andrew Clavin's son as a friend of mine Andrew Clavin is from a Jewish background he he is a Christian now and we have to be honest to people in ways that uh, honestly a lot of orthodox rabbis have not been in why do we demand a condemnation of Jesus and it's not it it, it really is not Jewish theology that's the surprising part it's Christian theology yeah yeah and um for the record that's not what St. Paul meant. <laughs> Being all things to all people. Um, he meant more like, for example, you know from my stuff, I don't have the issue with pronouncing the Tetragrammaton, but I'm not doing that on your stream. Thank you. <laughs> right? Because, right, I'm not going to do something, I'm not going to give offense, right? That's more what well, I have to ask St. Paul you. was talking about. Why why are you taking this this pronunciation, which supposedly academics have? It's it's not. I mean, I, I'm not sure it has any validity. Like, it, do you actually believe there there's convincing proof that this trans this is so, the correct? So I'm I'm pronouncing it based on a thread of interpretation based on the interpretation that it's a hifil. Yeah, I saw, that in your, I saw that in, in the notes to, yeah. to, to, yeah. to your book. Uh, Which probably not, does not justify it to you, right? <laughs> but, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure it, 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 it works. And, and if it does, I mean, yes, there are cases which the hifil, like you end up with a vav instead of a yud in, in the hifil, but that wouldn't make for the pronunciation that you're making. Well, it's anglicized too. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It, it, it's always yeah. like yeah, part yeah. of the thing for me is like, if if you can give me a, a convincing argument yeah. for why, you know, the, the Tetragrammaton was in a particular way. And this, this is, I mean, obviously of interest to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just don't find. Yeah, and it's it's used in translation as a Greek participle in some of our Orthodox liturgics. Okay. And in the Greek participle, it has that causative sense also. I mean, it sounds totally different, but right. <laughs> but, no, but I mean I, that, I have that translation to... idea, right? And so that no. interpretation of it. One of the things we say, and one of the reasons, so if. If you were ever to get uh, a prayer book like mine, which has um, various uh, various uh, nikud, how do I say nikud? Uh, vocalizations of the tetragrammaton in various places in the prayers, there are like the Kabbalists do discuss the various ways that it's possible for there to be a Nikud. But part of the thing, I mean, we do this thing in Judaism where we say that um, the consonantal text can be read in every way that it can be vocalized. And all of those meanings are correct. Right. So part of that is, and this is a, a, a tradition that comes in the Orthodox Church, at least, through St. Dionysius the Areopagite. Okay. Who's this marginal figure called Pseudo Dionysius of the West? Right? I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm not prepared to argue that he's actually first century. Okay. Um, some people will not concede that he's not on the Orthodox side, but. Um, but the the scholarly view in the West that he's from the fifth century, I think, can't be true because there's way too much Judaism in his writings. Eisenman uh, seems to think he's very early, doesn't he? Yeah, 
Yeah, for that, I think for the same reason that there's so much there that a later Christian wouldn't have access to. But one of his treatises is called On the Divine Names. Okay. And so, and there are definite connections here. He's sort of the middle point, I think, between some Jewish views and what becomes the Orthodox Christian view on this. And that is that the, the divine names are essentially energies of, of God. They're God working in the world in different ways. Mm, so they right. refer to divine activity rather than to the divine essence. Um, I'm only pulling this up. I don't even understand what it says, but it's Sam. So, But there are technical vocab from Proclus, who is in the 5th century. I, I don't even know what this question is. <laughs> there, there are Greek terms that he uses okay. that are traced back to different later figures. Okay. Right. And the problem is there's just too much we don't know. Right. Right. This is why I would not argue that he's first century. <laughs> right? I'm not prepared to make that argument. I'm just well, seeing things that look like they come from earlier than that. Th this is one yeah. of the things that I've been saying a lot is there are um, a lot of us, we're doing this linear regression where we're, we have data points and we're trying to fit a function to the data points. And um, honestly, for me, the Dead Sea Scrolls have been a huge dump of new data. Um, and personally, for me, it's like, well, this is all confirmation of, 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 my, of my function. But I, I see um, there are other people who are making, and this is one of the ways I, I, I see you functioning, is you seem to be like, okay, so um, this is new data, and I'm trying to integrate it into Eastern Orthodox understanding, which is which is great. I mean, I, I have my disagreements, but one of the reasons I do recommend you to, especially the anti-Semitic uh, ortho bros, which unfortunately there's a lot of them, is um, you make a defensible from everything I've seen, a defensible Eastern Orthodox Christian view in light of the information that there is. And frankly, that's, for me, far more important that we all be discussing in ways where whatever our function is, it's actually dealing with the same data points and it's an honest conversation of where we disagree uh whereas you know when i i talk to a lot of people it's really like that they, they just they're just missing a lot of data points well that's that's actually how i first started watching your stuff so if you want to know exactly what happened um i was i had done an I don't remember which interview it was, but it was an interview on YouTube. And I was trying to see if it had been posted yet. Okay. And so I searched for my own name. And uh, one of your videos came up in the search. And I said, oh, here's somebody talking about me. And of course, I had to skip the actual video of me because I can't watch or listen to myself. <laughs> <at all>. But... <laughs> I kind of skip around, and I said, "Oh, this is an Orthodox Jewish person talking about it. This should be interesting, right?" And the first place where I stopped it, you used the word that you just used. You said, "Okay, he's making a defensible argument. Here's where I disagree with it, right? But that's defensible." And I said, "This is a level of nuance that is not usual on the internet." <laughs> <laughs> In terms of a response so that's why i started it as i told you i check in once in a while to kind of see what you're talking about and what what you're doing but that's so yeah, what prompted that, that's you why. to contact me uh on this recently um i i did a check-in uh i saw you uh beating up on poor domine van der Klee. <laughs> uh, who was just expressing the view of the atonement they taught him in seminary, <laughs> which is wrong, but he was just telling you what he was taught in seminary. Um, 
Four <laughs> Protestants. No, this is this is the third, and and I have so much more material, especially from Mike Winger. Yeah. And like I I have this series. Why is Protestant theology so bad? And I don't nut pick. I'm not nut picking. I'm picking very smart Protestants. The problem with even very smart Protestants is. I don't care how smart you are. You're never going to be able to go up against thousands of years of thousands, if not millions of people seriously discussing and um, looking at all the text. Like what, what of one of the first, why is Protestant theology so bad? Mike Winger uh, things I did was, so he, he's like, you can go from Genesis to Revelations and you will never see uh, somebody uh, praying to a um, an angel or a saint. And I was like, is he using Genesis on purpose? Because like, Hamalach HaGoel OT, Mikol Ra? Like the angel who saved me from all, <laughs> like in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Like, and it's like, he's a really smart guy who reads his Bible all the time. But guess what? It's a huge text. And yeah. I, I, so, yes, I, I beat up on Paul and I beat up <laughs> on other Protestants, but it's yeah. it's not because I'm I'm, I'm not. I'm not, I hope I'm not being unfair to them. Protestant theology is necessarily bad because it is the product of an individual. Yeah, yeah. There's part of the problem is with even the word Protestant now, because, you know, Protestant used to reflect someone who was in a particular, they were Lutheran or they were Calvinist or they were, right? And now Protestant is just like they identify as a Christian and they're not Catholic and they're not Orthodox, right? So I guess they're a Protestant. <laughs> right. um, yeah, on, on Sunday I'm having a former former Mormon bishop on uh, uh, on oh. my channel. <laughs> that, that'd, that'd, that'd be interesting. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about this though. Okay. Talking about Protestants. I say this and I'm only half being provocative, but aren't aren't the Protest aren't the Eastern Orthodox in the United States the most Protestant Eastern Orthodox you can possibly get? Because ultimately when when it it's it's a very different thing. I mean, ha coming from Iran and understanding ethnic, you know, territorial things right it's very nice to believe that i can go to a greek orthodox church and convert and be accepted but let's face it there's going to be a lot of people in the few in the pews who are like i don't care if the if 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 the priest threw some water on you you're 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 not greek right and that I, I know that happens a lot in, in Russia itself with a lot of Jews who converted. And it was like, I don't care if the priest thinks you're you're now a Christian. You're not a Christian. <laughs> so yeah. 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 The in the United States, Puritan Protestantism is just the air everybody breathes. I mean, that's that. I mean, that's where woke Twitter comes from, right? That's just Puritanism, just atheist Puritanism, right? Like, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you're absolutely right. So, um, yeah. And so that's, I, I mean, uh, honestly, like a big focus. This is one of the, the reasons why, you know, We'll have to have another conversation in the future after you read the section on atonement and stuff in Religion of the Apostles. <laughs> but um, a lot of my stuff is directed sort of at that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I structured Religion of the Apostles like a Protestant biblical theology. Yeah. So that 
someone from a Protestant background picking it up would kind of, you know, have know the user interface, right? Like, it, <laughs> well, I mean, we can talk about Christus Victor. Um, so I, I definitely have a bunch. The reason I have done at least some of my commentary on your stuff is a lot of the people who, so I don't, my audience, there are a few Jews in my audience, but mostly my audience is um, Gentiles, often Eastern Orthodox, um, who are just wondering, like, what do, what do Jews have to say about this? And by the way, I have a Bible study Tuesdays, 6 p.m. Um, for Christians. Come and ask me whatever you want. But um, the so Christus Victor, like it's it is something. And a lot of people ask me about the types of stuff that you talk about. And that's, you know, I the, I can't listen to all the Lord of Spirits. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no normal human can. Yeah. <laughs> You guys, you guys should put it on YouTube, though. I, I would be much more likely to listen to it. It is. It is? It is. If you go to the Ancient Faith channel, Ancient okay. Faith Radio's uh, YouTube channel, uh, it's just a still picture with the audio, right? But <laughs> So Paul is making fun of, uh, we have a little meme here uh, uh, about <laughs> self-promotion. And no, I don't have a Patreon. I do have a Square site where you can donate <laughs> to this channel. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not above that. But um, okay, so I, I'll, I'll probably have to check out Ancient Faith, but then I'll have to sort out your stuff from all the other stuff. Well, that's have. the other, yeah. But if you'd search inside the channel for Lord of Spirits, you could just get those. Okay. Yeah, so Christus Victor, I mean, as I understand it, and I have to say, I, I think a lot of Christian um, theories of atonement, I mean, I, I, I just I just don't see them as good theories of atonement <laughs> because they are predicated on the idea that God can't just forgive you. Right, which and he can't. Like, but he can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, what is the problem here? Right. right, um, right. If, if if you if if you ask God for forgiveness, He can forgive you. And so, uh, what I have started talking about, and you might you might actually find this very interesting. I I, I did a, a video I called the Calculus of the Cross because I was uh, subtweeting Paul Vanderclay on his Logic of the Cross. Um, and it's not like Isaiah 53 is not part of our Bible. And as Jews, we're like, well, we'll just not read that part. You know, <laughs> no, actually, Isaiah is actually pretty popular and pretty important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not only that, this is one thing I do remember about Maimonides. He still identified that figure as the Messiah. Um, not as, not as. Not as Jesus, obviously, but as <laughs> Maimonides, as I know, there are. He's the last that it major is, Jewish writer I know of to do that. There, there are people. I mean, so how familiar are you with this concept of the Josephite Messiah? I am. Um, I'm not an. I'm not an expert, but I've recently read a bunch about it. Okay, so um, a. I actually contacted the author of this book. Um, I, I think it's called uh, Messiah, Son of Joseph. And it's the first full length book on the, the concept. And um, while I, I, I mean, obviously I, I have my disagreements with everyone. That's why I'm sitting here all alone. But um, uh, he, I, I think he did, I mean, I gave it a three star review for which for me is like three more stars than I give any other book. <laughs> but um, the I he makes what I think is a convincing argument and which I as an Orthodox Jew to the point to the degree that I'm an Orthodox Jew um, is I certainly agree with, which is the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef, which 
I mean, any Orthodox Jew should be familiar with. This is not, this is, it's not something we talk about with Christians. It's something we do talk about on a regular basis, is this concept of Mashiach ben Yosef as opposed to Mashiach ben David. And so within Judaism, it's quite clear, and I, I find it very convincing, that no, you can't be both Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, that the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef comes from the text itself. It is not a rabbinic invention like all of the academics would like to say, but it is in Genesis even. And that is the argument that I think his name is David Mitchell. He's a um, he's an Anglican, if I remember correctly. Um, he he's a, an Anglican cantor or something like that. But he, because of his interest in Hebrew uh, stuff, he he's written interesting books. Uh, I think it's David Mitchell. But so. Yes, Mashiach ben Yosef is a concept in Judaism, and it's not just, I mean, if I remember correctly, I'm not, I'm not sure it was Maimonides. There have definitely been people who are like, this is talking about Mashiach ben Yosef, right? And frankly, for me, um, one of my weird things, which my rabbis, you know, I've talked to and they're like, no, I don't agree with you but it's not heretical to say is I believe Christianity is Mashiach ben Yosef. So Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, Father Eric Seitz, he's a Roman Catholic priest and he's actually going to be hosting a just chatting stream on my show on Sunday on my channel. Um, he, he is a frequent guest and a, a friend of mine. And so when I went to visit him in his church, they have a relic of the true cross. And <laughs> what, you know, he was like, you sound skeptical. And I was skeptical <laughs> <laughs> because it's a chunk of wood that Constantine's mother, I guess, found when she went to visit the, the Holy Land. But thinking about it later, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, that's, that is a relic of the true cross. Because I'm pretty sure that came from a crucifix. And as far as I am concerned, um, that some poor Jew was innocently crucified for precisely what Jonah and how we understand the suffering servant is that, in fact, there is the suffering of innocent Israel for the redemption of the world. That's not a foreign idea to Judaism. Right. The foreign idea, I would say, is that Jesus is monogenes, but the idea that Ju rabbis were killed by the Romans and their, their suffering was so that the Romans could in fact be redeemed, that's in the middle of the Yom Kippur liturgy for the vast majority of Jews, the, the 10 martyrs. Mm -hmm. So that's not, like, if, if that's your concept of atonement, that's not, that's, that's not even foreign to Judaism. That's central to Judaism. Right, just... Just quickly before I respond to the rest of it, um, and you'll have to pardon my Greek pronunciation of the Greek, but Orthodox people will get mad at me if I pronounce it another way. Are you understanding Minoyanis to mean uh, uh, unique in this context or so, only begotten? Right. <laughs> That's... Well, so this is the this thing. Gets, this gets I... a lot of Christians mad at me when I point out it means the former, not the latter. But Well, <laughs> so the, the reason I have one of the reasons I have this right uh, is I don't think Jesus was saying anything weird when he says Marti Elohim atem. I have said and like as a Trinitarian that's 
you know, you believe Jesus is quoting God saying, I have said, you are gods. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think a Gentile world was able to understand the idea that when I say you are a hypostasis of God, I'm not saying that because you're an ordained priest. I am saying that because you were created in the image of God. And that's not Christianity. That's Genesis 1. And uh, for me, the idea that this was said of a Ben Mamzer, the son of a bastard, right? A, a, a child of rape. Um, if that is, and I'm not saying that's what Judaism teaches that Jesus was, but in a Jewish context, it is completely understandable that people would get mad that someone who is known at, to be the child of uh, rape would say, I am the son of God, and the elites might get mad, and the Romans might get mad, but he is saying something deeply pharisaic. And for the Gentiles, I believe, to be like, no, 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 he must have been born of a virgin, which, I mean, like, I we can get into it, but, like, the whole idea of a virgin birth is just silly in Judaism. Like, there, it's, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a Gnostic, like, anti, like, you might as well say you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead if you want to say that it's somehow preferable to be born of a virgin than to be born of a mother and father in Judaism. That's just incomprehensible to me. And so right. when I say monogenes or monogenes or however yeah. it is. You can say it right. however you like. I just don't want Greeks mad at me. <laughs> the, 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 idea, the idea that Jesus was extra special, yeah, that's, that's, it is problematic in Judaism, but partially because it, it, dev it denies his humanity. Right. One of the 613 mitzvot, one of the 613 commandments is to repent. And like the verse says, the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. Right. The righteous man falls seven times. I mean, that this is the idea of David, the repentant sinner. Right. And so the idea of someone who was so uh, pure that he didn't even poop. Yeah, right. <laughs> and well, we wouldn't say that, but <laughs> there were people who said this. Yeah, I'm sure there but, were. Um, but like removing Jesus from even being a the idea of being a repentant sinner, right? In Judaism, it's it's kind of accepted. You're to be human being, to be a human being is by necessity to fall short to chet, to miss the mark of being the image of God that we were created to be. And as long as you understand Jesus as being as perfect as he may have been, the fact that he is human itself is, in a sense, a, an inadvertent sin, right? That we have to repent of, right? And so if that's your understanding of Jesus... That's fine. But when you make him monogenes in removing his humanity, and I, and I really do believe this completely, the idea that he could not sin removes his humanity from him. How are you human if you could not sin? Right. So um, there's actually a lot of that <laughs> that agrees with, the orthodox understanding of, of salvation and theosis. Um, in that, um, the, the image of God functions in two senses for us. It is both something that we are, <laughs> right, by virtue of being human, and it is something that we become and aspire to, right? So it's both sort of the beginning and the end, right, of what it means to be human. 
And so one of the common statements for the Orthodox view of salvation is that we become by grace what Christ is by nature. Right, which that, is... So, the, I mean, so Sir Dabs a lot, who apparently you know. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. He, <laughs> <laughs> um, he, so he says something that I think is very relevant to what you just said. Right, and this is where I was about to go. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if being human in and of itself is sinful, then what was Adam before the fall? And now we start talking about what in Judaism we would call Adam Kadmon, not Adam Rishon, which is primordial Adam as opposed to um, as opposed to um, first Adam. Right. And so there is the two creation stories and guess what i don't believe they were concatenated from two different creation no, stories i, don't I actually believe one god wrote both creation yeah. stories and so the jewish understanding is that there was a primordial adam adam kadmon who um in fact was not physical and um so it it is considered heretical within Judaism to say that Adam Kadmon, prim primordial human humans, uh, primordial Adam, was physical, and Adam Kadmon very definitely is a hypostasis of God. Adam Rishon, where he was split into two, as we understand it was partially split into two because of the fact that it is impossible for there to be a physical because that's just part of the nature of being a maiden. And, you know, so a lot of the ortho bros will have heard that supposedly the, um, the Talmud says Gentiles are not human. That's not what it says. It says that idolaters are not called Adam. This is actually a law in, in the code of Jewish law, which is, I would say, the equivalent to our catechesis, right? Uh, catechism. It says that an unmarried man is not considered human. Lo nikra Adam. Because we theologically believe that any individual human being is only half a soul until you are married. And this is one of the things, again, Christianity might not agree with. But um, um, only a married couple are, in fact, a whole human being. So... Jesus, uh, unless you want to have some sort of androgynous Jesus, by, by this reckoning, fails to be a perfect representation, representation or hypostasis of, of Havaya, of the, the image of God. Because, like it says in Genesis 1, he is not male and female. And that is what Genesis 1 very directly says about the hypostasis of God, that Salam Elohim. Right. So, yeah, so to us, right, the idea that to be material is by nature to be sinful sounds Gnostic, <laughs> right? Um, the materiality, right, in and of itself, because, and this is, this is, I mean, this is a basic thing to Christianity, Um it may not seem so if you come from a more Puritan-based Protestant tradition. Uh, now I'm picking on Port Dominique van der Klee. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> the idea that the material world, all of it, is the vehicle for divine activity, which is God himself. Mm -hmm. So this is for the whole idea of sacraments, which we often call mysteries in the Orthodox Church. 
of water, of, you know, bread and wine, of, right, all of these material things. And for us, in the sacrament of marriage, the material is a man and a woman, right? Like, <laughs> that's, that's the material through which God works, right? Um, to bring life in the world, yeah. And so we would, we would, uh, so for us, it's important over against Augustinian views that Adam is created innocent, not perfect. He's created innocent uh, with the goal of, again, theosis, deification, right? At the end, right? So well, rather I, than I being created in that form and falling from it and then getting it back, <laughs> right? So, so, so yeah. just to be just to be perfectly clear, right? Yeah. The end goal, right? And we do believe ultimately in the millennium, however you want to uh, yeah. talk about yeah. that, in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. After the resurrection, there will in fact be this perfection. Um, and this was definitely a a, a thing during Second Temple uh, Judaism where there was a, a disagreement. And I have to say, I, I will default to Jesus um, when he was answering the question about the woman who had seven husbands, <laughs> right? You're taking it a little too literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and honestly, I, I have to say, I, I would love to see your reaction to uh, Maimonides and his his introduction to Perichelic, a chapter 10 of Sanhedrin on the Mishnah, because that is definitely considered fundamental throughout Judaism in, in, in ways that oftentimes people will say, oh, you know, Talmud, like the Talmud says, and it's like, you, that's, you know, um, and so I, I, I certainly understand the objection to Gnosticism. And I certainly understand the objection to the idea that being material is inherently sinful. And again, I, I, I would, I'm going to have to default to a tension there, right? There is a tension between the finite and the infinite. And ultimately we are attempting to return to godliness and adam kadmon right primordial man right had a descent for the purpose of ascent into the valley of the shadow of death which this is the world that we are in Right, Alma the Shikra, right? The the world of um, of lies and misunderstanding, and this is a world of Hevel, right? Vanities is how it's usually translated. Which, frankly, I, I the word Hevel just needs to yeah. be Hevel. Um, and there is an Alma the Kshuta, and a world of truth, right? Which is spiritual and the temple is where these two come together. And yes, the human body aspires to be a temple. And after the resurrection, we will hopefully be a that temple. But um, now I'm going to go really Jewish on you. <laughs> this is not the world that was promised. <laughs> <laughs> it, th this is one of the things I, I had to learn about Christianity is when Christians say Jesus is the Messiah, they don't they mean in Jewish terms, Jesus will be the Messiah. Because when you say to a Jew, Jesus is the Messiah, I look out my window and I'm like, you're smoking something. Because this is not the world of the Messiah. Right. Um, there's a part I, I will paraphrase in the Talmud that says, how do you know it's the Messiah has not come? And you put your money and yes, you can make Jewish jokes here. You, you put you put your hand in, in your pocket and instead of taking out a dime, 
you you take out a quarter and the the rabbis are are very you know careful on this language it's like well what's wrong with taking out a quarter when you when you thought you had a dime in the, in, in your pocket it's like well the world is not filled with the knowledge of god and um, this is this is what kills me about Jeremiah 31 and the Brit Chadasha, the the new the new covenant, right? The new covenant is that we will all, from the least to the greatest, know God, and therefore there shall not be any necess necessity for someone to teach his brother. That it's it's right there, and like Christians just gloss over that as if it's it's not there it's like you're coming and you're you're telling me hey 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 look the new covenant is already here and my thing is why are you telling me that why don't i already know it right right and so this this gets into gets into saint paul's theology uh, which uh you know i take a certain approach <laughs> Too. And I take a very different approach. And I yeah. have to say, I, I, I certainly prefer that Christians <laughs> take your approach to what they have for thousands of years. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I I think for thousands of years, Christians were right. That Paul was teaching uh, things he was accused of in Acts 21. That I don't he, think it's thousands of years. I, I think it's since Martin Luther. Let, let me let me ask <laughs> some Christians you, have been teaching if, that. So if if God forbid a Jew <laughs> came to your church and became a catechumen with his wife and <laughs> had a baptism and went through all the things and then they had a son, would you tell him that his son should be circumcised? I wouldn't say he should be, but I wouldn't tell him he shouldn't be either. Well, um, I, I, my question is, yeah. what, would James, what would James in in Acts twenty one say about that? I think he would. I think he would probably. It's tough. Anytime you're, what would he say? Right. I, I think I mean, as he's presented in Acts fifteen. No, 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 no. Right. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about Acts fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I did interpret that probably very differently than what you've. I, I was, I was I say incredibly about happy to see Acts 15 because James's letter is precisely what I believe Judaism has always taught. Yeah. And um, That's only the Eastern yeah. Orthodox have the Book of Jubilees in, in, in their thing. But um, look, I, I am here as an advocate for the Noahide laws. I would like all Gentiles to believe that the covenant of Noah belongs to them um, and that they are in fact not adopted or grafted into the house of God but from the very beginning God had a relationship with all of humanity um, and you know this is this is what like Romans makes me want to pull my hair out and as a bald man this is like <laughs> difficult thing to do but um I find the opposite of what I found with Jesus, which is when I read Jesus, I could hear the Talmud in his speech. I could hear Jesus was Jewish and not just Jewish as in born into Judaism, right? But actually believed in Judaism as I see it. And Paul, on the other hand, I don't believe, I, I, I certainly don't believe he studied under Gamliel. And um, I, I don't know if you've read The Mythmaker by Chaim Maccabee. Uh, it, it, it's not very popular among Christians, but <laughs> I think he gets a lot of it correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean, first, if I was Jewish, I wouldn't defend Martin Luther's haircut or fashion choices, let alone his biblical exegesis. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> I would defend nothing about that guy. But um, 
So how, how do I want to approach this first? Um, so I'll, I'll start with Acts 15 because I'll do you one better. I don't think it comes from the covenant with Noah. I think it comes from Leviticus. I think it is an incredibly literal application of what we call the Holiness Code. We scholars, I don't know if anyone in the Jewish world calls it that, the Holiness Code in Leviticus, right? Um, which is chapter 17 through roughly 23 or 24 different people cut it off in different places. Uh, and here's why I think that, because if you go through those chapters of Leviticus, in most cases, Moses is told, go say to the sons of Israel, okay. right, do this. In four cases, he's told, go to the sons of Israel and all of the, you know, alien stranger, right, foreigner who lives in the land and tell them this. Right. Mm -hmm. Those are the things they have to follow. One is Leviticus 18 with the sexual morality commandments. Okay. Twice it's having to do with eating and drinking blood. And once it's about participating in sacrifices to idols. Okay. So it but maps to exactly the four that... things in Acts 15. Right. But how is that not Moses? reflecting the earlier covenant in oh i'm sure it is i'm sure it is nine of the noahide covenant but but because the reason i want to emphasize that yeah. is that this is not any kind of rejection of the torah or its commandments mm. but gentiles who come into christianity are being treated as you know the alien or the foreigner or whoever has now come to live with us in our house so a, a ger toshav, right? right? That, yeah. That's that's how we would refer to right. uh, a, a thing. And um, I mean, whether or not being a Noahide is exactly the same thing as being a ger toshav. And uh, I mean, ultimately, I don't think we're really disagreeing at all. The I guess the only difference for me would be why is this something that happens after Jesus as to something that's always been? Well, so this has to do with, honestly, my uh, understanding, the Orthodox understanding of the Eucharist. Okay. And the connection at a very early level, I mean, in the pages of the New Testament, to between the Eucharist and the eating of the Passover. Because if the alien or the stranger who's dwelling in the land wants to eat the Passover, he okay. has to go and be circumcised. Right? He has so to, is, right? So this is part of the thing of, of the Ger Toshav. And um, I mean, that's, 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 a, that's an interesting way of looking at it. My question would be, why does, like, if... If a Gentile who, if a Gentile does not eat of the Passover, does that somehow make this Gentile not a child of God, not um, a, a worthy of the world to come and the resurrection? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the problem being that we're admitting people to the Eucharist who aren't circumcised. That's what Acts 15 is called to address. From my perspective so right? we're letting just, these people come in they're not really becoming part of us and we're letting them eat the eucharist so why doesn't it say that directly though i mean you're you're reading it it's a it's a very interesting interpretation well, but that's not place, what it sounds like he's saying he's saying no you don't need to be circumcised you 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 know you can learn moses and you can follow these these rules and that, as far as we're concerned, and it, truly, I mean, I, I get people, especially Muslims, because uh, since Islam doesn't have the problems of the Trinity, um, Islam is considered Noahide, without any question. And I, I, if you have to go, let me know. Oh, no, 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 uh, I'm fine. I think um, you've got a hard out at sundown, right? Um. I kind of do. Yeah, I, I'm so, not, I'm, but I'm, I'm, not I'm, actually, fine. I'm fine. I'm not actually uh, observant, and it's okay. two hours. Old then. But um, 
So, I mean, if I'm going to get sh- to talk to you, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah. God be damned. I'm joking. <laughs> God, it's awful. Um, no, but um, the the Jewish idea is, okay, God is obviously the God of the entire world. And this is why Jonah, right? So arguably, the book of Jonah is, in fact, the um, most important liturgical reading of the entire Jewish liturgical calendar, right? Um, it, It is the final reading at the end of Yom Kippur. And we read the entire book of Jonah. And the lesson of the book of Jonah, and it's not, it's not like coded. It's very, very <laughs> clear, right? Is God cares about Gentiles, even if that means the Jews have to suffer. That is exactly the moral of Jonah, is Babylon is going to be more righteous than the Jews, and they're going to come and destroy our temple, right? And Jonah is told, God cares about even the animals, (laughs) going back to my problems with with Paul, um, even the animals in Nineveh. Right? Yeah. Because there is Many one God. Yeah. <laughs> he cares about all, everyone. Right? Yeah. This is fundamental to Judaism. And this is yes. what makes me so mad. Like when I read um, Romans 9 and 10 and I guess 11, it's not that he talks about the Jews being, you know, rip, ripped off the tree as if that's possible. Well, we can we can talk yeah, about that. we'll talk about that yeah we can talk about that what gets me is the idea that he says the gentiles are grafted in and my question or adopted and my question is in a monotheistic world where there is avachad lekulanu one father of us all what are you talking about? Like, which tree were they part of before? Like, and and that's what I find so offensive about Romans. Like, as if the idea is that we as Jews, and Islam really believes this, a lot of Muslims really believe this, that... Um, we as Jews don't go around proselytizing or trying to convert people. And we turn, we even turn people away because we believe they're not good enough to be saved. And we turn people away. We don't turn people away because like, that's not the story of Ruth and Orpah, right? It's not that Naomi hates Orpah and wants her to go to hell. It's she, honestly says to Ruth, um, no, 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 no. Like, you don't have to be a member of Israel because the God of Israel is the God of the entire world. We don't turn people away from converting to Judaism because we think we're consigning them to hell. And this concept that you need to be integrated into Christianity, that Jesus opened, ripped a veil, right, between <clears throat> Jews and, and Gentiles. I have to say, 1 Corinthians 12 is the oldest record I know of, of a very important Jew, uh, Jewish teaching I believe in, right, that there is a body of humanity and different people are different parts. And yes, we say Israel, Lee Roche, right? Israel is the head, 
because we were, we are like, it's a historical fact. I, I don't know why I have to argue with Christians that salvation is from the Jews. Like, don't you already believe this, right? At the same time, we believe that the rest of humanity is part of that body that 1 Corinthians 12 talks about. And not being part of Israel, not being part of the head, doesn't mean that you can't be part of the hand, and the hand does in fact go above. And this is like within Jewish mysticism, I, I am sure this comes from far before 1 Corinthians 12. And that's my problem with the theology of Paul. Right. So in, in terms of Acts 15 itself and the connection to the Eucharist, where we see this play out, like in Galatians, where we see sort of a little bit of the, you know, the, the issue between Saints Peter and Paul and the men from St. James and Jerusalem and all this play out, it's precisely about table fellowship. It's precisely about sitting and eating together. And those meals were the context in which the Eucharist was served at that time. So it's precisely about who's allowed in there and right. and and who is who is not. So and the this, perception yeah. that St. Paul had basically taken the whole process out of it, right? That that or, or even any kind of checks or anything. He was just letting anybody. But, <laughs> right. okay. um, are are you really restricting is is a Saturday night, a Friday, if you were to come to my house for Friday night Kiddush, right? It's not the Paschal offering. You, right. you can eat of, like, it, it, why is it this Paschal offering, which is somehow so central to salvation? So it's... There are a couple pieces there. One one reason is that it's constitutive of what makes someone right a Christian. In the same way that I, this is why Passover is connected to the birth of Israel, right? The the person who wasn't there historically at the birth of Israel participates in the birth of Israel right? by eating the Passover. Right. And well, it's, I mean, you're reiterating yeah. what I disagreed with, with what I disagreed with this idea okay. that it's imp imperative. I'm not talking about salvation. Gentiles. I'm not talking about salvation here right now. Well, you kind of are, though. I mean, if somebody is not part, is is excommunicated, is, is he going to hell or not? We don't say he goes to hell, no. No, so this is, this is. I have said this publicly many times and publicly issued this challenge and no one has ever taken me up on it. So I think I'm secure in saying it. Find me one place where any church father says Christians go to heaven and non-Christians go to hell. One. And no one has done it yet. The church fathers are always threatening Christians with going to hell. <laughs> because of the way they're living their lives. Right? And St. Paul makes this point. This is, this is Romans 1 and 2. Romans 1, he goes on and on about the wickedness of the Gentiles. right? But then in Romans 2, he comes back and talks to his fellow Jewish people. and says, yes, you received the Torah. You've received all these things, but have you kept the Torah? And he says there are Gentiles out there who, not having the Torah, have kept what they were to keep. And they're in a better place than you are who received the Torah and didn't keep it. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, no, we don't draw that line. Right. We don't draw that line. And if someone does, if someone claims special knowledge about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, they're sinning. According to traditional ancient Christianity, because all judgment is left to Christ. So we're not talking about who's saved and, and who's not. Right. We're, we're talking about. Right. I mean, who's an Israelite and who's not. Right, who who's Jewish and who isn't? That's an objective well, thing, right? Okay, so so I have to ask you: um, Do you believe? I mean, so in 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 Judaism, we do have a caste system of priests, Levite, 
Israel, Ger Tosha, right? Do you believe in this hierarchy? Um, I, th I think much less so, right? Because for us, there is much more mystery to it. So St. Irenaeus in the second century says, we know where the Holy Spirit is. We don't know where he isn't. Right. So if someone comes to me and says, I want to come to know God more deeply, I'm going to invite them to my church. I'm going to talk to them about Orthodox prayer disciplines because that's how I believe that happens. But I'm not going to say that someone else in some other church or outside Christianity completely, that the spirit of God is not working in their life, is not doing anything, let alone claim that they're going to hell. Right. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I am supposing you don't believe that there will be a third temple with a priesthood. No. Well, not really. No. I mean, I believe the Christian priesthood is a priesthood, which Protestants don't, for example. <laughs> but, well, um, I mean, so, so that, I mean, that actually begs the question. It seems to me that in early Christianity, it was kind of presumed that, um, the priesthood, the the bishops would be in fact Jewish until there was the de-Judification of the uh, the church. So was was that a was that a, a working of the apostles that that Gentiles can also be bishops? I, I would say yes, <laughs> right? Um, that's because there, there are certain requirements in terms of knowledge and that kind of thing, which especially in the early phases of the church, there wasn't, you run into practical realities. Like obviously once the Romans come through after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, there's not a Jewish person to be the Bishop of Jerusalem or Alia Capitolina as it became, right? Like, or anything. Not. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, you know, the Jews were also, uh, prohibited from Rome. Right, where they were expelled from Rome and came. That's actually what I think occasioned St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, was the expulsion under Claudius and then the Jewish people returning. Meanwhile, the Gentile Christian community had sort of continued in their absence, and now there needed to be this reconnection of the community. Um, I think that's what actually occasioned occasion Romans, right? But so we offer, when we offer the Eucharist, we're offering it as a sacrifice, not just for the people there who are going to eat of it, but for the whole world. Right? And, and everyone and everything in it, right? Well, the Paschal offering, so this is the, the other thing, like there's no atonement, con, like the Paschal, like there's no atonement components to the Paschal there's not, offering. There's not, I agree. I agree. Um, and one of the worst things Michael Heiser ever said that frustrated me the most was he once said, well, substitution is just obvious at the Passover. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you even talking about? <laughs> it's not only not obvious, it's not there. But um, so part of what happens with the Christian Eucharist. So it's usually translated uh, when, when uh, Christ institutes the Eucharist with his disciples it's usually translated as do this in remembrance of me mm. i think that's a mistranslation because i think it's a reference to the greek of numbers 10 10 uh in the septuagint which i was very happy when you said because i have to fight with orthodox people about this all the time that the septuagint is just a particular translation of the torah so <laughs> Um, and not just anything Greek from the Christian Old Testament. But uh, yeah. Numbers 10.10 numbers 10 refers to uh, the uh, daily offerings as remembrances. It uses the same Greek word that Christ uses. So I think it's better translated as do this as my remembrance. This is going to be the sacrifice going forward. And so it includes within itself, and the language we use has wrapped up in it, thank offering, right, uh, grain offering. We, we pull in a number but of these things. Is, but this is talking about the Rosh Hashanah offering. 
Which? I'm sorry? The the Rosh Hashanah. Right. It's the Festival of Trumpets. Okay, sorry. The offerings are referred to as remembrances. My point just being, I think he's using that. That word in Greek was being used to, as a term for not just thinking and remembering something. Mm. Right. Over against yeah. the common Protestant interpretation. Right. We do this and we remember Jesus. Right. Yeah. I'm looking at the Koran yeah. Jerusalem Bible and they translate it as a memorial. Yeah. Um, so all we see all these things is take, being, being taken up in there. This is one of the differences, I would argue, between Orthodox and Roman Catholic theology of the Eucharist is that the Roman Catholic theology of the Eucharist explicitly says that it's an atonement for sins. And while we believe it is a means through which we receive the forgiveness of sins, and it's connected to confession, right? You go to confession and confess your sins, and then you go and receive, right? In the same way you would confess your sins and then participate in a sacrifice, right? Um, but we don't see it as, an, as well, our whole thing view of atonement is different, right? <laughs> then, okay, so if, if yeah. Acts 15 is not about salvation, then why would you not tell a Jew that he should circumcise his child? Uh, so this is what I think... Now, we're assuming this is a Jewish Christian. I'm, I'm saying a yeah. Jew comes to your church, yeah. becomes a catechumen, Baptized, yeah, becomes, you know, right. all He's the now things an Orthodox you Christian. Do, you, right. you exercise him, all the things you do, <laughs> and then his wife has a child. Right, right. Uh, the reason I would not say that he should is fundamentally because we believe that baptism does now does what circumcision did. So. This so I would not see it as a necessary problem. thing for him now. The, so this is my problem with 1 Corinthians 9, where um, Paul says, uh, does God care about the animals, right? And he says, oh, no, no, no. And he, he takes and he spiritualizes the commandment not to muzzle your animal while he's thr threshing. See, I read that the exact opposite way. I think he's there endorsing the Torah, not well. If away, he's right? endorsing the Torah, then why again? So you have this spiritual baptism, which does the same thing as as as, as circumcision, but why are you not actually? Or uh, let's let's take something else. Should he eat pork? Can he eat? Is it a sin for him to eat pork? I would, if he is a Christian, I would say he is, it is not a sin for him to eat pork, but I would not what? require him to. You don't have what? to eat a or bacon a cheeseburger as a rite of initiation. Yeah, yeah, it is no longer required. So you're, so you but are. He would be free to. You are, so you are doing precisely what what um, what Jesus talks about in Matthew of uh, of saying the law is fulfilled and you don't need to. You, yeah, let's no let's no I, I no I dis I disagree I disagree with that I think see part of it is there's two different reasons there right like the, they aren't to me the same issue right so baptism doing what circumcision does right is is one thing uh, okay. when we're talking about uh, but I would say baptism is necessary right as a as a Christian. Um, whereas the whole issue with the food laws has to do with, again, our understanding of the material world and what Christ's self-offering did in terms of purifying the material world. So from our understanding, those animals are no longer unclean. And that's why it would now be okay for someone. So how are you not in fact doing precisely what Jesus said, which is you're getting rid of jots and titters of the law? Well, because we're, we're not getting rid of it, right? I could still say to my people and have, you should touch no unclean thing, 
Right. But if some things that were previously unclean are now made clean, that means you can now touch them. So everything is now clean. You're you're getting rid of this differentiation between clean and unclean. In, you're, you're telling in me terms of the material clean. world, I'm what? not saying everything is now clean, right? Pornography is not now clean, right? <laughs> like there's there are all kinds of things that are still unclean, right? But the material world as such, nothing in the material world as such is now unclean by nature. Where, by okay, nature. Where, so I understand where in Christian theology you're deriving this from. Yeah. But before, I mean, when I was reading your book, you're telling yeah. me that Christianity is a continuation of Judaism. Yes. And then now you're telling me Jesus did away with the i'm not saying he did away with anything i'm saying certain things changed because from a christian perspective we went from one age into another age but but parshat shmini which spends all that time talking about all the birds you can eat and all the birds you can't eat and like god just wasn't paying attention when he wrote those no i'm not saying that at all no so so I'll go into more detail of this, of how I understand. So this is part of how I understand what St. Paul's doing here, right? Is that the, the, the Torah constructs, there's sort of a series of concentric circles that I think maybe another way of talking about the levels you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. right? So there's Israel among the nations, right? The, the, at the core, God is dwelling among his people. And so Israel, the nation in which he's dwelling, is called to a higher standard of holiness than the nations who are outside Israel. Yeah. Right. Within Israel, right, the Levites are kind, called to a higher standard. The priests, yeah, right, them. the high priest, most of all, right, yeah. uh, because he's going to go on the Day of Atonement, right. So there are these concentric circles, how close you're drawing to God. Right. And so... This is this is honestly this is the topic of my dissertation. Ultimately, is what say, John is doing in First John two verse two, in, in terms of atonement. Um, whereas you have John the the two, two you said yeah, yeah. I actually wrote the dissertation on two verse two d five Greek words, two of which are and and the. It was exciting, but uh, <laughs> um, and. In that context, it's a long argument, but um, that when St. John is talking about the world there, it's often mistranslated in English as not only for our sins, but for those of the whole world. And that those of is added. What it actually says is not only for our sins, but for the whole world. And so within and right before that, he uses high priestly language regarding Christ. I argue that this is building off of the day of atonement when he talks about atonement he's talking about the day of atonement ritual he has that in mind and you have the two elements with the two goats right the one which takes away sin and then the other whose blood is used to cleanse the the sanctuary right and the sanctuary has to be cleansed on the day of atonement because this is where right god dwells and even on the material objects, there's this sort of taint left from Israel's sin, right? However we want to describe that taint or whatever residue. Um, and so with that first part, he's talking about Christ taking away sin. Elsewhere in 1 John, he uses the language of Christ's blood purifying, wiping away, right? This um, kefir verb language. Um, and so when he says for the whole world, He's talking about the whole world becoming, at least in potential, the sanctuary where God will dwell, which will not be realized. And this is a basic tension in Christian theology between the way in which Christ inaugurated the Messianic age in a sense, but it remains future. Well, so, no, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. And there is this idea. I mean... So, for example, there are many rabbis who will say that the reason the word for pig in Hebrew is chazir is because 
it will choser, it will come back to its pu purity, right? And there is this idea that ruach hatuma, right? The the spirit of impurity will be removed from the world when the Messiah comes. What becomes my question to Christians is, you really see the world <laughs> like the 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 are, 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 you're you're telling me this is. This is what happened two thousand years ago. Um, I, I that there's a lot of things, right? And especially if you're telling me from a Christian point of view that we inaugurated this, um, and the Jews who didn't get it uh, didn't, and there was this special purity, you know. Um, Look, I can. Uh, it's not your fault <laughs> that the Roman Catholics did the things that they did in, uh, to people like Edgardo Mortara, but I'm not sure that the Christian Church, as it's continued for the past two thousand years from its inauguration, has been the perfect example of the spirit of evil and impurity being taken off the world. I, and I could, I concur. Not, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not an argument you're going to find me like finding convincing that Jesus somehow removed impurities and made the world purer in a fundamental way like we expect to happen in a messianic era when so one of the things jordan peterson said last night was um if you're if you're he was asked about high school students who didn't want to go to, go to college and he said you know the good test to know whether you have a good reason to not go to college or a bad reason to not go to college is are you going to do something at least as equally as hard right and um i have to say for a lot of people christianity for the past two thousand years has been judaism easy and it's cute to tell me that in fact, you know, Paul was bringing a higher standard and Jesus purified things so that we spiritually could be more pure. But um, I would say the lesson of history and um, I would say history is God is that in fact, when you get rid of the letter of the law and when you get rid of these rigid and and actually very material rules right is you don't end up with more spirituality you end up with less spirituality and um you know if if I'm not wearing the phylacteries and I'm not saying Shema in the morning and the night. Guess what? I am going to have a lot. I am a lot more likely to fall into egalitarian Trinitarianism. Like, even if I'm going to tell you, like, let's, let's say the monarchical Trinity isn't so bad. And I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it's kosher. I'm just saying we're not going to call it idolatry. The least worst option, yeah. <laughs> what many rabbis have said is it is it is a perfectly fine thing. And actually, so somebody sent me this quote from Rabbi Emden that I will read to you in Hebrew and then translate because I'm not smart enough to do them um, to do them uh, simultaneously. But uh, where did it go? Um, 
Uh, Rabbi Yaakov M. Emden Katav wrote, Ki Hanotsri Asa Tova Kafula Baolam, the, the Nazarene did a double good in the world, Mitzad Echad, from one way, Chizak Torat Moshe Bechol Oz, he um, made strong the Torah of Moses in every way he could. And there's not one of our sages who spoke more about the importance of Moses, he's saying, uh, with an f- open mouth, in the, in, the, um, in the eternal requirement to keep to the Torah, and from a different side, to the uh, uh, other nations of the world, he, he did a great uh, good benefit to them, that he destroyed, uh, destroyed idolatry, and he took away the idols from them, and he uh, um, made them keep the seven uh, mitzvot b'nei Noach, the seven commandments of the uh, Noachides. So shelo yihu ked behemot hasadeh that they should not be like wild animals. Vezika lahem b'medinot b'midot musriyut, and he um, gave them the benefit of uh, a spiritual. Um, Understanding, notzrim hem kehilot shepoalot l'shem shemaim. The um, Christians are congregations that work in the name of God. She noadu lehis lehis lehiskim. I think um, I'm not sure that that word's written correctly. Uh, to that they're known in what they do. Kavanatam he l'shem shemaim. They they have an intent for the uh, name of heaven. Vescharam lo mana and God lo yimna and God will not debri- deprive them of their um, their reward. And this is from Seder Olam Rabbah. Um, it's quoting Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who was a great rabbi of previous times. And um, frankly, a lot of what you're describing, I am very, very happy that Christianity has in fact led to a lot of Christians um, not being (laughs) idolaters and studying the Torah. And, you know, there's, there's one member of our community. um, Every time he talks about the book of Job, he starts crying. And it's like, for me, like to see that love for our Bible, right? I'm how how could I see that as being anything less than beautiful, right? At the same time, the Christianity that you're describing is a Christianity which sounds to me like saying, hey, uh, yeah, Jesus didn't actually accomplish all of the things that we believe the Messiah will accomplish, but let's pretend. Right. And that's, that's where that tension I was talking about comes in. And this is another thing that's deeply embedded in St. Paul's theology, right? He calls the Holy Spirit dwelling within us the deposit or the down payment of the age to come, right? It's, it's the beginning. And so... I mean, yes, we have, right? And I, and I think there are places in the prophets where it is talked about this way. Uh, that would be a really detailed discussion, right? <laughs> but, um, where there is a separation between the coming of the Messiah and the end, right? In which various things happen, right? But we have separated the coming of the Messiah in two, right? We have, that's why it's referred to as the second coming, right? <laughs> that's... And so we see in between that the eight, life of the age to come is set before us as the goal, as the thing we're working towards, as the thing we're firing and 
pork and pushing is, towards. But you're telling me that pork is kosher. <laughs> I'm telling you, actually, what St. Paul says is that it can be. Not that it is, but it can be. If it's received with prayer and thanksgiving. It, it sounds to me like Judaism easy. Right. Well, part of what you said when you talked about, and, and by the way, I think that is exactly the criticism directed at Paul that occasioned Acts 15. You're making it too easy for these Gentiles to wander in and be full participants. Right? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, because, because, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, like, I don't think the seven Noahide laws are too easy. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think it's, it's a low standard. I, I I just think that God in his infinite wisdom said that while it's perfectly fine for you to eat pork, it's not perfectly fine for me to eat pork. And I don't know why. This is one of the chukim, right? And I don't have to understand why. But it is one of the things that God in his infinite wisdom commanded as an eternal part of the Torah and all your philosophizing, like, so one of the things I have to explain to, to Christians is, well, they ask me, what is your scripture? And I say, it's the five books of Moses. And so what, right? There's definitely more in our scripture than the five books of Moses, but the five books of Moses says quite it, uh, clearly, you cannot add or subtract from the five books of Moses. And so what I, every other book in here, my requirement is that it be a repetition and a reinforcement of what Moses taught. And when I read Jesus in, in the Gospels, especially in Matthew, but not just in Matthew, he is, I, I have yet to see a place where Jesus says, and not, I mean, the parenthetical remark, in saying this, he made all foods clean. It's like, yeah, that's, that's your parenthetical remark, but it, 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 it's what I call the crayon. It, it doesn't, yeah. like, if Jesus had actually said all foods are clean, then I could I could safely say, okay, he was a heretic and he, he went against Moses and, you know, he was just another heretic. That's fine. What was surprising to me was that, no, I don't find that in Jesus at all. I do find it in Paul. I find somebody who's willing to say, we are not like Moses, who hid his face with a veil to hide the, the fading of the light. And when someone says to me as a Jew, we are not like Moses, he's not bragging. He's not condescending to Moses. He's declaring his sin. So right. your Paul in Judaism is not saying we are not like Moses. He's saying we are exactly like Moses. Yes. Yeah. I, well, that particular passage, I mean, this is another particular thing. So I would argue what St. Paul's referring to there is the fact that Moses had to go on the mountain alone. And when he returned, even the reflecting Why the fading of the light right. for what even, was going away. Right. And when he came down, even the reflected glory was too much for the people. Right. It was too much for the people. That's why he had to cover himself with a veil. And what St. Paul goes on to say is now that veil has been removed. He's trying to talk about how we now, for him through Christ, now do not have to fear to approach ourselves. So we no longer need a mediator figure. But I don't think that's referring to the commandments of the Torah in general is what I'm getting at. I don't think that's... I mean, right? So... I mean, there is a uh, there is a basic disagreement. I think part of the core is what you said, that you, that you said that the Torah is eternal. And I think that's the place where Jesus you disagree with St. Paul. As well, long as well, long as Jesus says, as long as the earth and the right. So yes, what, what yeah, says, yeah. Well, right? But it was also added at a certain point for St. Paul. Well, right? he said it was 
well, I was I was absolutely absolutely floored when I heard him say uh, say it was ordained by angels. Oh, that's he's just referring to the Book of Jubilees. It was given by angels. It was mediated through oh. angels. The so because says the same thing it, I know. I mean, the Protestants were like, "Yeah, oh no, no, no." The Torah was given by angels. And I'm like, <laughs> I, yeah, I, they I, don't I, understand I, that. Had, there, there yeah. was nothing I could say because, <laughs> because honestly, there is nothing as fundamental and foundational to Judaism as Mahmad Har Sinai at at uh, standing on Mount Sinai, and as a people. Right. And again, I, I mean, Maimonides, uh, the laws of foundations of the Torah in in if, if you want to understand Judaism as it is constituted today, I would say Maimonides, the laws of the foundations of the Torah are is basic reading. Um, and Sinai is is the foundation of our of our religion. And. So, again, it's, it, it comes down to, for me, until you say that, uh, I mean, all the stuff you say sounds all great until you tell me that um, in your church, if a Jew comes and becomes a member, suddenly pork is kosher. But it is potentially, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I would not, I would not because of their, so part of the problem here is once they become a Christian, you're still- They are no longer Jews? Well, that's the, that. in what sense are they still, right? So in an ethnic sense, yes, right. But these are not ethnic laws. Whether or no, not- No, I know, I know, I know. It's not but, an ethnic law. This right. is a- but, but you're saying they apply they apply to, to, to Jews and not to Gentiles. Yeah. Right. It so, always applied to Jews, not Gentiles. Right. I, and I agree. But the question okay. is what's what, what is this division there? The division there is I mean, within Judaism, we have a caste system. There's a there's right. Cohen Levi Isra. Right. And that's you know, because somebody is a Cohen, right? They they perform certain services and there is a they are doing a certain thing that doesn't mean that uh a cohen is going to get into heaven be more or right, right, less right, right, than right, right, i do right, right, right. but this is this is part of the hierarchy that the torah establishes which is you know women certain and so another uh, verse of of uh, of Paul, I, I keep on going to. So if you understand this idea of um, there is no Jew or Gentile, man or woman, free or slave in Christ Jesus, and it's it's up to you how you understand it, right? But if you're understanding it in a in a similar way, there's no Jew and Gentile as you understand. There's no man or woman. Right, I, I don't think you have any problem with saying women cannot be ordained to the priesthood. Right, that right. doesn't mean God doesn't love women. Right, and in a very similar sense, I would say Israel is mamnachet kohanim, a nation of priests, and it says, attempt, you know, attempt to you leave mamnachet kohanim, you will be for me a nation of priests, and I believe that is eternal, and. I mean, part of the funny thing about it is Christians will tell me, you believe that Jews will be sitting, you know, at the top when the Messiah comes. And it's like, do you disagree with me? You believe <laughs> like a Jew will be the king at when, like, where is the disagreement here? Right. <laughs> um, there, There is this idea like and if you want to read paul as saying that just as there is no man or woman there is no jew or greek and you still right. understand Which, yeah slave and free same thing obviously there were people who were still enslaved and and right. and, so, yeah. and 
And I would say if if you're willing to see, uh, okay, um, so yeah, the Jews are going to in fact be, Israel is still going to be a nation of priests in Christ Jesus, then yeah, I don't I don't have much problem with that. But once you suddenly turn into a priest, uh, like once there really is no difference. And I think, I mean, I, one of the things I have come to believe is that God exactly as <laughs> exactly, somebody asked if I'm going to talk about Philemon because we're going through all the stuff I talk about, but um, <laughs> the, the, um, what, one of the, one of the things um now I, I lost my place um so what one of the things i was surprised about christianity was i i really do see that god has planted within christianity what what maimonides says is the preparation for the world right so when paul says we now see the world through the glass, uh, through a glass darkly. Um, I, I actually think it's true. Christianity is Judaism viewed through a glass darkly because it is those things which God made. It, it's, it's, it is Judaism easy as far as I'm concerned, because the Gentiles were coming in out of the complete darkness and they were only willing to accept certain things and um yeah this idea you know but now as we are coming to the end times i believe right i am in my own life i am seeing that verse from uh zachariah i believe it is which says you know 10 men from every uh nation will grab a jew by uh by his talit by right by the hem of his garment and say, we want to go with you because we have heard God is with you. Uh, that That is, I see something coming true in, in, in the world. I am seeing Israel, in fact, being, and Judaism being established. And one of the things I see is this disagreement that people are like, what's a woman? Uh, well, what is a woman? And it's like, yeah. I can I can understand how a man and woman can be different in Christ Jesus and I can understand how a Jew and Gentile can be different in Christ Jesus and there is a form of hierarchy and again 1 Corinthians 12 and I I am unapologetic about this yes I believe we are the chosen people that's not because I believe it is in fact, the opposite of me believing that um, that I am somehow born better than you, I am going to heaven and you're going to hell, um, or anything like that at all. And for me, like Jesus says, do not be like the Gentiles. Those who those who want to lead will be the servants. And in a very real sense, I think as Jews. Being Mamlachat Kohanim, being a nation of priests, means being servants, right? But there is a specific service that includes a holiness code, which includes things like wearing phylacteries, like wearing tzitzit, like all of these things that as a nation apart, God has commanded, and I don't think that's going away. Right. So I think part of this may be, again, another difference between the Orthodox perspective and Protestantism in that when I say that, for example, baptism does what circumcision used to do, right, did in the Old Covenant, um, I have to be honest and forthright and say our understanding of fulfillment means in a fuller way, in a more full way. So an example with baptism that St. Paul does, right? Mm. Circumcision, obviously only done to males, right? <laughs> and the, the wife or the daughter is sanctified by the husband or father's circumcision. 
Well, we have to go back to uh, being a a whole human being. So uh, a woman's circumcision is her husband's. Right. That is. And the daughter, right. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. A woman's circumcision is her husband's. So an unmarried young woman is not. And an unmarried. I mean, she's to eat the man, Passover. That's what I'm getting like, at. She's, like right, I said, because her father, right, is an, an un an unmarried Jew is, is at, at least in or in rabbinic Judaism, how we understand it, is not a full human being. Okay, but a five year old girl is still going not to eat the Passover. Is you're not going to say she's not well, Jewish, right? Well, like there's a connection there. But we can stick with spouses. We we can stick with spouses, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) There's actually an interesting place in Colossians where St. Paul says we've all been circumcised with Christ's circumcision under a similar... That's okay. That has to do with the mystical marriage of Christ and the... Right. Um, But... uh, So St. Paul does that with baptism when the question comes up of the spouse who's been baptized... It is a Christian, especially a, with a Gentile who's, you know, husband is a pagan. Right. Right. And that was most commonly the woman, because most early Christian Gentile converts were women and slaves, <laughs> because they had the most to gain, you know, uh, by being told they were human. Um, <laughs> in in the Gentile world, that wasn't a shot at, at what you're saying about Judaism. Yeah. No, no, no. yeah. Um, so, uh, but St. Paul says that works both ways. So if the wife is baptized, right, and is faithful, she sanctifies her husband, he says. Okay. So he takes that understanding of circumcision and he applies it in both directions. Right. So for him, that's an example of how a fuller thing. So, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I can't really apologize for the fact that I think it's better to be an Orthodox Christian than to be an Orthodox Jewish person, right? Like, obviously, I'm an Orthodox Christian, right? <laughs> you know, well, funny thing. Like, I, yeah. I, I honestly cannot say that it's better better to be a an Orthodox Jew than an um, a a Muslim, right? I, no, I, I honestly I, and do I, not believe that is a difference. Yeah, that is a difference, right? I mean. That's Matthew 28 for us. Christ says, go out, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them, right? right? right. They, there's no Orthodox Jews who go out and circumcise all nations. Right? And make them, Not at all. Yeah. That's, that yeah. doesn't exist. No. Right. I, yeah. and, and this is... I mean, <laughs> okay, so yeah. I, I, I have to pull my other thing, which is yeah. like my, my belief that the ultimate religion cannot be proselytizing because... The, the fullness of the light has no need for converting anyone. Right. The ultimate, the, the, the fullness of the light, and this, for me, the fact that Christianity and Islam are proselytizing religions is an indication that they are, in fact, the, the, the light viewed through a glass darkly. Right. So, again, taking the salvation part out of the picture, mm. right? Um, for us, right, we would say we have had certain things revealed to us in terms of the path that leads to salvation. That doesn't mean without them you can't find salvation, right? But knowing them, right? If this is wisdom from God, knowing it certainly helps, right? So while you wouldn't go out and try to persuade someone to, you know, become an Orthodox Jewish person, I'm sure you'd be very happy to have them reading the Torah and trying to apply at least many of the commandments to their life. Um, Only the seven commandments, right? only only the commandments of Noah, which we believe God reveals like I, I believe Christian, well, like Rabbi uh, Yaakov, and then said there, he believes Christianity is how God revealed that to Christians and Islam. Many rabbis, in fact, almost all rabbis, agree 
Islam is is how that was revealed by God to to billions now of of um, of Muslims. And so, yeah, no, no, no. This is this is a different de definite difference. Yeah, it is. It that is. it in that we we very seriously believe in kind of like this perennialism, right? Now, to the extent that Islam, for example, disagrees with Judaism, which I'm not sure how much that is, and certainly all the differences that I know between Christianity and, and Judaism, again, I'll I'll have to say you're you're I believe you're you're viewing through a glass darkly. And I do believe when the Messiah comes and everyone will know and there will be that new covenant when no one shall need to teach anyone that in fact everyone will realize oh moses was always right from the very beginning right um but for me that religion is truly eternal there was no flip even i mean to some extent there is a flip at sinai but this is part of like the Midrash. We say that even before the Torah was given at Sinai, the, the fathers knew about it. And, and their people like because the Torah was always what God always intended. And for me, again, I have to say, when you look at history, right? So one of the things I say is um, when you look at, uh, in Isaiah, it says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Um, even a hundred years ago, the idea that that was a literal truth, that people from literally all over the world would come to the mountain of Zion, right? Like Christians certainly did not believe this. Muslims, whether or not they believe this <laughs> is, a, is a whole thing, but how exact that prophecy is coming true in our lifetime in a very literal sense for me is is possibly the most faith affirming thing i can i can look of like how do i know that the torah is that this tanakh is more true um than you know uh the book of mormon i have here is um, the prophecies in here are eternal and amazingly so. And I'm seeing them come, to, come true in ways I never imagined in my own life. Whereas um, I can't say the same thing about the Book of Mormon. I think you'll agree. Um, yes. And honestly, I can't say the same thing about the New Testament. Uh because much of it, I think, has shown itself through history to not work the way you're describing it, such as um, if a person throughout history had gone to their local church, they in fact would have found people who uh, taught them to be more moral than what I see throughout history Judaism taught. So, yeah, so there's a there's a couple things there. One thing is this might be a possible way through in that I think the flip that we see happening uh, in, in Jesus is exactly, and further on in the Religion of the Apostles, I describe it this way, is precisely the kind of flip that happened at Sinai. Including the fact that from a Christian perspective, the prophets beforehand knew about it, right? Had the idea that this was coming. Now, obviously, you disagree, but it's precisely that I don't kind of flip, right? So this is why for us, Christ's death and resurrection is a new Passover. And we celebrate it annually as the Passover. And Pentecost is a new Pentecost. Stuff, but, but why isn't all of that stuff here written clearly? I mean, at best... Christians will give me a lot of um, will give me a lot of you know Christology and hints and pos like so why didn't God 
clearly, instead of saying Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, which, oh, which is another thing I need to ask you because you're the only person I know who knows enough Greek to check. <laughs> the Orthodox Wiki claims, and I can't check, that Justinian's code made it illegal for Jews to, um, made it illegal for Jews to recite the Shema. And if, like, why isn't that a confession, right? That, uh, and I, I, I heard what you said, you know, the, that the Paul's, uh, we have one, uh, one God and, and one Lord Jesus is a restatement of the Shema. Well, uh, wouldn't have been it been great if God had kind of like, you know, said talked about the Trinity clearly in 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 the five books of Moses and said, oh, you know, my son, as opposed to I, you know, I am not a man and <laughs> I have no son. He had said, you know, actually, my son is actually going to come and you all really need to believe in him. Because. Right. None of that. <laughs> right. So part of our, in, in terms of uh, St. Justinian's Nomo Canon, uh, Greek won't help you because we don't actually have it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we have secondary, sor secondary sources talking about it. Okay. And I know this because there are some interesting things in it that I've tried to do more research on and run up against this that we just don't have the original text. One of those things is that he actually uses the language from Leviticus in regard to, because it's called the Nomo Canon because he's trying to take sort of church canons, the church law and the civil law and bring them together. And so part of that question is what parts of church law apply civilly, apply to people who aren't Christians, right? Um, and part of how he decided that apparently from what we know is uh, he used actually the Torah. So for example, when it talks about sexual immorality, it uses the language of the land will vomit us out if we allow this to take place, right? Mm -hmm. In our right. in our empire, right? So I'm fascinated to learn more about how he was thinking there, but run up against it. Um, so a part of our understanding is that not only was Adam sort of innocent at the beginning, but that humanity as a whole has matured over time. Okay. And part of how we understand the history of the Hebrew Bible, the history of our Old Testament, is that God was through time refining this faithful remnant of Judah to whom okay. Jesus would come as the Messiah. And part of that refining of that, re that remnant was a gradual revelation of himself in different ways but right, over time. But isn't the opposite of, the, of precisely what your book is arguing, that there isn't a, a gradual revelation that, that God's, that the religion is like, that isn't that the thesis of your book, Religion of the Apostles, that... It right. isn't so, gradual? Well, for us, right, the fullness of the revelation comes in Christ. But the, in terms of the book, my thesis of the book is more talking about this evolutionary view of religion. So for me, ancient Israelite religion is not identical to Second Temple Judaism. Okay. Right, in its practical outworkings, right? Okay. <laughs> but the religion is fundamentally the same in the sense that it is worship of the same God, right? It, it is, it is, uh, that's not what changes. And then the argument of the book is from second temple Judaism into Christianity. Likewise, there's not a fundamental change. Christianity is not a different religion. It is picking up on currents and later Judaism is picking up on other currents. It's okay. Well, I mean, we, we okay. do the same in a gradual refinement. So, like, right. when we're talking about various periods, I, I certainly believe there's a reason why, you know, there's 5,783 years of, of Jewish history culminating in the last 6,000. 6, and I believe there has been a 
a refinement of the world. And I see Christianity as part of that and Islam as part right. of that. Right. Right. Um, but that is a very different, I mean, it's, it's a very different way of looking at it than, okay, 2000 years ago, Jesus came and gave a, a full understanding of God's teachings. And for the past 2000 years, like this is, I tell people if I were, if I were convinced of Christianity, my question would be, why shouldn't I become a Muslim? <laughs> and why shouldn't I become a Baha'i? Right. Because I'm Jewish because I believe God got it right the first time. <laughs> And if you're going to tell yeah. me God got it right the second time, my question becomes why 2000 years ago, not why not 1400 years ago? Right. And why not today? But that's something we ultimately can't know. Right? Why why didn't God give the Torah 100 years before he did? Well, it's no, other I mean, than Moses. We, we actually right. so we we right. do talk full, about right? the generations and so yeah. I, as far as we're concerned, there was a culmination at at Mount Sinai. There right. was a particular thing, but ultimately, like we have, so it is going to be a theological crisis in Judaism if we hear if we hit the year six thousand, and things have not changed because the Talmud talks very much about. A thousand years is like a, a day be, before and the the right. seven, right? And the 6,000. We've been going for three hours. I could keep on going for a very <laughs> long time, but I'm guessing you have things to do. And <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I, I, yeah. when I said, God be damned, I was, I was joking. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, sure. it is getting close to sundown here. Um, I would love to continue this discussion um i want to give you as much time as you would like or need to say anything you would like in <laughs> like and then we will uh yeah. we i you are i will give i i will email you admin permissions and my <laughs> channel your channel i am not even joking um because the like I know this has certainly been my most popular stream and I'm sure it's going to be my most po popular uh, thing on my channel. And it's been absolutely incredible. It's been one of the honors of my life. I'm not even joking. Um, I have learned an incredible amount from you. Um, and I, I am definitely going to have to think a lot of the things you've said because it's interesting and you do present a defensible we're having an honest conversation here right um i i'm not saying things just to say them i am um i am saying things because i believe them and if you were to change my mind um i honestly since i was a child i used to talk to missionaries um because if they could convince me that jesus is the messiah like, why wouldn't I want to? Like, if if the Messiah has come, I, I would love to know about it, right? And I think this this type of honest discussion is is incredibly um, valuable. And so, please uh, take as much time. But I just wanted to thank yeah. you and explain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thank you. So. Yeah, and I, I hope we will do this this again in the in the future. Not you know tomorrow, but <laughs> you know, but but again in the future because I think we left a lot of stuff on the table here that we still have to to uh, to discuss. And it's been my my sort of best case scenario doing this today that I hoped for was that you and I might start a friendship and this would be the first of many discussions. So hopefully that's where we're going. My honor so, to be a friend of Father Stephen Dion. Um, so the, the, the one thing that I don't want to totally leave on the table, right. um, is because you mentioned a couple times the historical record of Christianity mm. and, um, this is something that we as Christians have to be honest about. 
right? Um, and as, as I said, Christianity, as not least of all St. Paul presents it, is this is something we aspire toward and work towards and fight towards. There is a, a pretty famous modern Orthodox saint who said Christianity is fire or it's nothing. And we have to be honest about the fact that for most of Christian history, Christianity has been basically part of just the superstructure holding up whatever societies and cultures and kings and emperors have been doing. Uh, and that's allowed elements of Christianity to be weaponized against people. It's allowed, it's allowed these things to happen, right? And... To me, in terms of beyond just academic goals, right? Like, you know, I want to help people understand the scriptures better and those kind of one of the big goals of everything I do as a as a priest, and I am a priest, I'm never not a priest, but <laughs> um, what the goal of one of the goals of everything I do is to try to, for as many people as possible, reverse that. And to create in my parish here in Louisiana, to create as many other Christian communities as will do it, uh, to create communities that are fighting and struggling and striving to actually put the teachings, the commandments of Christianity into practice in a way that not only isn't just being subservient and being infrastructure you know superstructure for <laughs> the world right but actually gets at and undermines the base and the foundation of what the world is and what it's doing and transforms it yeah uh, and i think if we can do that we'll be much closer to making the world the way it should be in the messianic age not only for us but for everyone <laughs> right not only for us christians yeah. but for everybody right. uh than we are right now so that's what I want to say sort of as we sign off for today. Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And this inversion theology needs to be on top. And, you know, this is something that we're seeing in this world. And I think this, this corner of the internet really is trying to, again, right the world. And I have to say, you know, this is part of my thing. I, I personally am very, very um, anti uh, against, I no longer call myself an anti-Zionist because of all the anti-Semitism in criticisms of Zionism. But um, my my the reason I spend so much time talking against Zionism is, look, when you make religion a subservient to a state, um, you're 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 just you're asking for trouble. Because God has to be at the top of the hierarchy. Um, yeah. Okay. I am going to let you go. And I am going to hopefully make it to synagogue. <laughs> and um, we, uh, you are welcome anytime. And uh, good night, everyone. <laughs>